Broken Links, Infinity's End, Book 7, by Eric Warren. Narrated by Larry Gorman. Prologue. I'm hearing disturbing reports, Admiral. Fleet Admiral Arden Dix glanced up, just as the lanky form of Zir Fax strode into his office, as if it were her own, taking a seat without invitation and staring at him with her six bulbous speckled eyes. Because she ran the Coalition's media division, he was used to her brashness. But the way she could command the attention of a room just by walking into it never surprised him. Dix returned his attention to the latest report scrolling across his screen. Sure, they were the very same report she was speaking of. Pleasure to see you as always, Zir. How's the family? She clicked her small tongue in what he'd come to understand a form of amusement by the Yaxine axe. She folded two of her arms across her chest, while the other two brushed errant particles of dirt off her long skirt. Very funny. Less than an hour before the biggest story of the season is about to run, and I received notice it's been pulled due to executive order. Care to tell me why? A grin pulled at the edge of Dix's mouth. I don't owe you an explanation, or anyone else for that matter. You are not to run any stories on the reported loss of the USCS Tempest, and that's the end of it. She made the imitation of a chuckle, but it died in her throat. I don't think you understand. That ship and her mission has become the stuff of legend. People have built their lives around our news releases. There are fan groups, meetups, conferences, conspiracy theories, all of it. At the head, me and my team feeding the public a well-crafted and carefully moderated set of facts every single day to give them something to feast upon. Do you know what's going to happen when we run the dailies without mentioning the ship? Let me guess. Dix turned his eyes to her again. Pandemonium. Now you're just being an ass. Zir uncrossed her arms and leaned forward. Ever since that ship left Coalition space for parts unknown, it has become a staple of the public consciousness. People have the right to know what's going on. She smiled, correcting herself. At least they have a right to know what we tell them is going on. Dix exhaled, staring at the woman who had been head of the Coalition-sponsored news outlets for the past 15 years. She'd always been a rogue, taking matters into her own hands when it suited her. But she also had great instincts about what needed to be said, and what didn't. When the whole mess with the Atlas occurred, she was the first one to come out against telling the public the truth. And she'd been right. There were some things people didn't need to know about things that would undermine the trust they'd put into the system. And as long as she was willing to work hand-in-hand -hand with the military to keep the stories flowing, all was good. But they'd run into a roadblock, one Dix wasn't keen to try and remove. Fine, he sighed. If you must know the truth, it's our sill visitor. Ever since we lost contact with the ship, she's been growing more and more anxious out on Starbase 8. Sangby tells me she's refusing to help us any further until either the ship returns or we regain contact. And that concerns me how? Bax said. Because, guess who was a regular consumer of Coalition news programs? And when she caught word of a certain ship traveling at impossible distance in a short amount of time, she managed to put two and two together. A story I didn't authorize, if you'll recall. He narrowed his eyes. Fax sat back again, huffing. Shit! How much does she know? Sangvi promised to keep her in the loop, but he and I had decided it was best not to allow her too much information, at least until we were more comfortable with her motivations. Her singular focus was supposed to be developing defenses for Andromeda, but that's all out the airlock now. The Andromeda threat had been the whole reason Dix had approved Tempest to head to Sil Space in the first place, and it had paid off thus far. In the few seasons since arriving to Starbase 8, Maless had helped to improve their defensive technology by almost 10%. She had managed to work with not only humans, but many coalition species, to develop the technologies they would need to defeat the threat. Then Andromeda had just disappeared, and Tempest had covered a distance of 600 light-years in five days, 
a trip that should have taken them almost a year. Information they'd managed to keep under wraps until Fax's story had broken two days ago. Look, people are getting restless. I had to give them something. We've had no news from the ship in almost a season. It's important to keep the public interest. You mean it's important to keep them foaming at the mouth? Dick stood. All for what, Zeer? Ratings? Accolades? Don't start in on me with that, she replied. You're just as complicit as I am here. I may have run the story, but you authorized the mission. You brought the sill into our midst. I can't even imagine the chaos the one on Tempest is causing. Her eyes went glassy as she dropped her voice. I knew I should have stationed a news crew on that ship before she left. The point is, Dix continued, to try and salvage this relationship. No more about Tempest until we hear from them and she can talk to her counterpart on that ship. She thinks our people captured the other one and tortured her until she revealed Sill secrets. It hasn't occurred to her the other Sill might have given up that information willingly. Did she? Fax asked, her six eyes wide. That's what Green's last report to Starbase 5 seemed to indicate. But we don't have confirmation. And you know how those people are. The evidence has to be rock solid before they'll accept it. It seems to me there's a very simple solution to all this. Dix didn't prompt her to continue, but she did anyway. Lock her up, and don't allow her access to any more news programs. Facts stood. You can't be serious. What do we need her for anymore? Andromeda is gone. Whatever Tempest did worked. That was the only reason she was here. Send her back to Sill Space, and let me do my job for the people I actually care about. Dick shook his head. I'm glad you're head of media and not operations, because you have no concept about the term diplomatic incident. Oh, please, she said with a dismissive wave of her hand. What are the Sill going to do? They didn't come after us when we captured one of their ships and ejected the crew into space. I doubt they'll make a fuss over two more. It's like Rabo told us in the hearing. They just don't care that much. Admiral Dick sighed again. This woman. Still, it's too hot right now. Hold off for a few days before any more Tempest updates. You say that like you have a say in the matter, Fax replied her voice having gone cold. I'll run what I deem the public needs to hear, and that's the end of it. Dix felt his face reddening. That's not the end of it. Under no circumstances are you to run that story. Do I make myself clear? Fax regarded him for a moment before turning her back on him. Very well. Perhaps the public would be much more interested in a different tale, a much more sordid story about a former admiral named Rutledge and a ship named Aklis. Dix's heart skipped a beat. He placed his hands on his desk and leaned forward. Don't you threaten me, Zir. You would not like the outcome. She turned back to him, a grin on her face. You do what you have to, Arden. She reached up with one of her long arms and stroked the side of his cheek. Her hand felt cold and smooth to the touch but he didn't bat it away. Just remember, I have eyes everywhere. There's very little that happens in the coalition I don't see. She spun and left through the automatic doors without another word. Dix tapped the comma at the back of his hand. Get in here. The doors opened again to reveal a man with porcelain skin and light blonde hair that had been pulled tight into a ponytail and dropped just below his collar. His dark eyes contrasted with his pale skin and hair. Dix often thought his face resembled a skull. He didn't say a word, only stood in front of Dix's desk. There's going to be a communications blackout in an hour, Dix said, taking a seat and returning his attention to the reports on the screen. I don't want it to be permanent. Do you understand? The man nodded, then left the office, leaving Dix alone with his thoughts. Damn, Zier. This was the first time she'd openly opposed him. Hopefully, for her sake, it would be the last. 
Her timing couldn't have been any more serendipitous. Just as she'd walked in, he'd been going over the most recent telescopic scans from Starbase 5. It had been 56 days since they'd heard from Tempest. And not more than a day after they'd lost contact with the ship, the entire Andromeda fleet had disappeared from all their scanners, with not another word since. Dix wasn't sure if Green was a strategic or diplomatic genius, but at this point he didn't care. They'd managed to do the impossible and stop the alien fleet in their tracks. Not if they could just figure out what had happened to Tempest itself. He couldn't understand why the ship hadn't just come back the same way they'd gone out there. He'd even considered sending a rescue vessel to meet them halfway, but had decided to hold off until they knew more. It was possible whatever plan Green had enacted could have potentially destroyed the ship, despite the fact they hadn't detected any explosions. Ever since the fleet disappeared, they hadn't detected anything, except background radiation. The entire region had gone quiet. Dick stood. The whole encounter with facts had put him off, and he needed some fresh air. He left his office, nodding to his assistant at the adjacent lobby, before emerging into the glass atrium that made up this part of Coalition Central. Horace shone down through the glass with its warmth, and he longed to feel the heat on his skin before he had to meet with the joint commanders about this sill situation. Perhaps Fax was right. How bad would it be if they did just lock her up and ship her back to her people? Or better yet, he could have some of his people fabricate something that showed the Tempest had been destroyed. They'd have to be careful, but they might be able to pull it off. Then she'd go back home on her own. Dix emerged into the sunlight, relishing the warm breeze as it blew across the bay. Before him, New Phoenix canvassed the valley all the way to the blue ocean. The city was one of the oldest and most influential in the Coalition. And of course, the seat of Coalition Central itself, with a compound taking up almost 30 square kilometers around the Bay of Chiron that began deep inland, then fed into the ocean. It was a beautiful old city, and yet it still felt as new as the day humans first settled the area. Dix glanced up to see both Neath and Packet hanging above him, their twin white crescents barely visible in the deep blue of the sky. He couldn't fathom how any human would choose not to live here, to be stuck in the depths of a ship or on some other alien world, never experiencing the daily wonders of Earth. As Dix stood, breathing in the fresh air with just a tinge of salt water, he thought maybe he'd been too hard on facts. She was ambitious, determined, and the best director of communications the Coalition had ever seen. She'd managed to keep public opinion on their side this long. Perhaps he should trust her judgment. Dix reached up to tap his calm when it started going off. Go ahead, he said. Admiral? We have a major br- All sectors are reporting- The line cut off. Dix tapped the calm again, but it was dead. That shouldn't be possible unless the satellite network had malfunctioned. From behind him came the yells of panicked people, yells he'd only heard once before, during his time on the battlefield. Before he could turn to see what the commotion was about, a dark shadow fell across his view of the city and the bay. Dix glanced up to see a gigantic ship had appeared out of thin air, and now blocked not only Earth's moons, but the sun as well. That's... that's not possible, Dix said to no one in particular. For a ship to get this close to the planet, the entire planetary defense grid would have to be offline. And the primary outposts that protected this system. And all the Coalition ships patrolling this sector. He didn't recognize the ship. Its configuration wasn't familiar at all. His heart thrummed in his chest. Something had gone very wrong. Dix thought of his family at their home on the far side of the bay. A home completely covered by this alien ship's shadow. He frantically smacked his comm again and again, to no avail. Admiral? Hands grabbed him from behind, pulling him back toward the glass atrium. What? How? He'd lost the ability to form coherent thoughts. There's no time. We have to... The voice behind him said. He recognized it as Commander Macheski, one of the officers stationed in his building. But before Macheski could complete the sentence the bottom of the alien ship opened up. 
Dix barely had the chance to register what was happening before Macheski grabbed him by the jacket and yanked him back in the building. Outside, the world turned to fire. Eighteen years later. One. Caspian Rabot couldn't believe it. The bay looked brand new, as if Tempest had just launched from dry dock yesterday. The floors gleamed with a polish he hadn't seen since his academy days, and there wasn't a tool or piece of equipment out of place. The entire bay was spotless. Shall I take the first spot, sir? Ensign River sat at the pilot's seat, her mechanical hands working the controls. As close as you can get us, Cass replied. We have wounded. She nodded, and the shuttle turned ninety degrees as she pulled it into one of the launch positions. The shuttle shuddered as it set down to the deck plating and the engines cut off. We're down. Box? Cass yelled. Get the wounded to sick bay. No delays. You got it, boss, he replied from the crew section of the shuttle. Cass glanced out the window to see Zenfor, an older Zenfor, standing at the door to the main corridor. A few of the crew rushed past her, including Ryant and Wolf. Cass was stunned for a moment. They'd all aged, from what he could tell. Could Zenfor have been telling the truth? Could they have been down at that planet for nearly two decades? Cass opened one of the side hatches and hopped down, as Box coordinated moving their injured out of the back hatch of the shuttle. The other shuttles had followed them in, and were in the process of setting down themselves. Sax had the back of her shuttle open and ready for as soon as they touched down. Anson River jumped out behind Cass and ran around to the back to assist with the injured just as Lieutenant Commander Keeley Wolf came jogging up. Her signature pink mohawk was long gone, replaced by a smooth head free of any hair at all. She stopped in front of Cass. Where's the captain? Injured, he replied. The corners of her eyes showed crow's feet where none had been before, though her eyes were just as bright as ever. What's the situation? Shit, she replied, confusing him for a moment. Her eyes scanned his face. She wasn't kidding. You haven't aged today. For us, that's about as long as it was. Cass caught a glimpse of Box carrying Evie through the exit, while two other crewmen helped Jan onto a sled that hovered right above the ground. Zax ran across the open area, accompanied by Nurse Mankel, who now had gray in his hair. What happened? You never came back. That's what happened, Wolf replied. We lost you on scanners, just like you lost Wave 1, and I wasn't about to send the rest of us down there. We figured you'd been destroyed. Right. Their time with the planet. He and the captain had agreed to split them up into three waves, each to go down at a different time in order to minimize the risk. After they'd lost contact with Wave 1, Evie had gotten impatient and ordered Wave 2 down. Three had been scheduled to follow a few hours later, but they never had. The whole planet, it was like a lens through time. We arrived 70 days after Wave 1, despite leaving only an hour later, Cass said. Their actions at the Athru Temple had changed the speed of the planet somehow, increasing it dramatically. We weren't supposed to be gone that long. How did you survive? Not all of us did, Wolf replied. We used the stasis pods in sickbay as long as we could, while Zenfor and Sester worked on the ship. Cass's comm beeped. Go ahead. This is Captain Coley. All the space wings are back in bay, too. Should we prep a shuttle to retrieve the rest from Wave 1's camp? No, Cass said. Under no circumstances is anyone else to leave this ship until further notice. Understood? Yes, sir. Coley out. Cass shook his head. The last thing I need is someone else lost a time. He returned his attention to Wolf. Who did we lose? Jackson, Wakeman, Sharpie, and Racine. All in an accident about nine years ago. They were doing some routine maintenance. Well, you can read my reports. There's quite a few years worth to go through. We need to have a senior staff meeting. Cass motioned for Wolf to walk along with him. All around him, the crew was unloading supplies and locking down the shuttles. What's the ship's status? About as good as he could want. We've had a long time to get things back up and running, Wolf replied. We even made some improvements. 
She smiled as they approached Zenfor. Caspian, she said, it's nice to see you again. He was taken aback by the gentleness in her voice. The woman he'd left had been much harsher, much angrier. And though he could see she'd aged, it fit her well, like she'd always meant to have been older. Hadn't she told him Syl lived hundreds of human years? Are you okay? Okay is a relative term. I am uninjured, have enough food in my system, and am well rested. You look good. Thank you. Cass glanced around. It was like being on a brand new ship. Wolf hadn't been kidding. I don't understand. If the ship has been repaired for some time, why didn't you just leave? Why stay here? We wanted to, Wolf said as they made their way down the corridor with Zenfor following behind. But with less than thirty people and other extenuating circumstances, it didn't seem wise. Even with all the repairs and improvements in the ship, there's only so much that can be automated. We couldn't leave until we had a crew. Wait a second. The entire ship is operational again? Cass asked. One hundred percent, Zenfor replied. Does that mean your engines are back up and running? With their improvements? Zenfor hesitated. The engines are back to peak efficiency. Which means we can be back in coalition space within the week. Holy shit, Cass said. When they'd taken off from the planet, he thought they'd have to gather whoever was left on Tempest, take the shuttles, and start searching for another way home. He'd thought they'd have to become like the Bulak, scavenging the galaxy for handouts until someone took pity on them. Have you spoken to them? What happened with the Athru fleet? The Athru? Wolf asked. It's what Andromeda call themselves, Cass replied. They're down on the planet. Or at least they were. We haven't spoken to the Coalition, but there's another more serious problem, Wolf said. Which should wait until we have gathered everyone, Zenfor said. I don't want to repeat myself on this subject. Cass caught Wolf wince, but she nodded in agreement. Yes, very well. The captain, is she critical? The captain, Cass began, before stopping himself. He hadn't decided what to tell people. He'd been too concerned with getting off the planet and back into space. And now that they found themselves on a damage-free ship that was ready to rocket back to the Coalition, he wasn't sure what to do. He needed time to think about it. She suffered some head injuries down to the planet. I don't know how much longer she'll be out. I should go check on her. He peeled off toward one of the access corridors. Where are you going? Zenfor asked. The hypervator is this way. Cass stopped short. Right. I guess I'd just gotten so used to taking the corridors everywhere. It's only been a day or two since the ship was falling apart around me. Now I wish I'd gone down with Wave 1, Wolf said. If you had access to the stasis units, Cass began, how come I look so much older? Not all of us stayed inside the entire time. We had more crew than stasis units, so we had to keep switching out. And in those early days, when the ship still couldn't generate a stable life support system, we were in and out of enviro suits a lot, too. But the longer time dragged on, the more repairs we ended up doing. I didn't want to stay in one of those stasis units and wake up 50 years later to find myself in the exact same situation. Most of us didn't. And once we had large sections of the ship repaired, life on board got easier. I stayed out a total of seven years. Seven years, two hundred and twelve days, Zenfor corrected. Wolf rolled her eyes. Some stayed out longer, others shorter. It depended on the person. And after we lost the four, space in the stasis units became less of an issue. They reached the hypervader and the doors opened. I'm guessing you didn't take any time inside, Cass grinned at Zenfor. Eighteen years for me is like two for you. I enjoyed the solace. She didn't grin as she said it. That was more like the Zenfor he knew. The doors opened on level 14 where sickbay was located. Cass stepped off as Wolf and Zenfor attempted to follow. Actually, I need you guys to gather the senior staff. Until he decided what to do, 
The fewer people that saw Evie, the better. I'll speak with Zax about the captain's condition. I'm sure we have a lot of confused crew members on this ship right now, and we need to give them as much information as we can all at once. Get the staff together, then we'll join you in... The conference room, Wolf said. Right. Because everything was fixed. Yes, in the conference room, at about 15 minutes. Make a ship-wide announcement that we'll be informing the crew of the situation shortly. Wolf hesitated, then stepped back inside the hibernator. Yes, sir. Zenfor gave him a strange look, but then the door slid closed and they were gone. Cast let out a breath of relief he hadn't realized he'd been holding. He turned and jogged down the corridor to sickbay. But before he got inside, he could already hear the commotion. The doors opened to reveal nurses running about with patients on beds and yelling for some relief. Cass spotted Box across the room as he was hunched over a crew member, his one eye still dark and his arm useless at his side. Even damaged, he was still committed to providing the best care he could. Maybe he wasn't such a bad doctor after all. Strong arms encircled Cass and compressed his entire body together to the point Cass thought he might crack a rib. The arms let go and spun Cass around, so he was face to face with Dorsey Ryant, one of the few space wing pilots who hadn't gone down to the surface. Ryant had been scheduled to go down with Wave 3. It's been so long, amigo, Ryant said, holding Cass by the shoulders. He was a good ten centimeters taller than Cass. And despite the age on his face and in his eyes, he still had those damn flight goggles perched on the top of his head. You must have some good genes. No, it's just the time dilation, I know, Ryan grinned. Jan already told me. I was just messing with you. He motioned over to the bed where Jan sat, her legs prone out in front of her, both ankles encased in a machine emanating a blue light. Cass glanced at Box, who seemed engrossed in his care. He didn't see Evie on any of the beds. He could spare a few minutes. Can you believe it? Jan asked as he and Ryan approached. Eighteen years. Well, not for all of us, Ryan replied. I've only been out for a collective four years. Gotta keep that youthful glow. He motioned to his face. What glow? Jan said. You just look more curmudgeonly to me. Ha ha, he said, sarcasm tainting his voice. I'll have you know I spent most of that time practicing my dogfighting skills. I bet I could do circles around even you. Yeah? I'd like to see you try. Jan moved to get up, and the machine repairing her ankles buzzed loudly. She settled back into her original position. After. After, he agreed. Cass heard the sick bay door open and close again, but didn't think much of it until Jan narrowed her eyes. He turned to see Chief Diana Raffenkel, leader of the Space Wing Squadron, standing beside him, glowering at the three of them. She was covered in dirt and grime, and her blonde hair was matted and hanging in her eyes, but she seemed not to notice. Saturina? Dorsey? All right? Church Chief, Dorsey said, hesitant. Just getting my legs patched up, Jan replied. Raffenkel turned to stare at Cass a moment then walked away, leaving sickbay the way she came. Something had been off about her ever since they'd caught up with Wave 1 down to the planet. Laura had said she'd been uncharacteristically quiet down there, and Cass still couldn't figure out why. That seem odd to you? Bryant asked. Yeah, Cass replied, still watching the door, half expecting her to come right back through. Oh, good. I thought maybe it had just been so long... If you guys don't mind, I need to go check on the captain. Ryan nodded while something like a shadow crossed Jan's face. Cass couldn't be sure, but she didn't know anything, did she? They'd been at one of the space wings attempting to get it up and running when Box had sent up a comm telling him what Evie had done. And by the time they got back to the camp, it was all over, and Evie was unconscious on the ground as Zax tried to save her victims. Not that Zax knew either. Fox had assured them there had been no witnesses at the event itself. Cass shook the thoughts from his mind. He needed to take care of this right now before it got out of control. He flashed a quick and disingenuous smile before leaving them to find Box. 
As he reached his old friend, he got a very good view of just how much he'd been damaged. Things had been so chaotic on the surface, not to mention they'd been running for their lives half the time, and the other half they'd been inside a dark temple where he couldn't half see his hand in front of his face. In addition to being blind in one eye and a useless arm hanging at his side, Box had multiple dents, scratches, and injuries. Two of his primary servos on his neck had been severed when Evie had hit him inside that temple, and his other arm still sported the makeshift bandage Cass had used to stem the flow of fluid leaking from his system. He was looking over one of the security personnel who Cass could only assume had gone toe-to-toe with the bare things on the surface, as he had multiple gashes and contusions across his body. "'How is he?' Cass asked, approaching them. "'The crewman here will be fine,' Box said, "'as long as he doesn't move, and we get him into surgery as soon as we can. I've placed him in a stasis field for the moment.' Cass glanced around. There was no one else close to them. What about Evie? She's in the back. The doc wanted to look at her after she finished with Zal. Box didn't take his eyes from the screen. Is he going to be? Too soon to tell. It will be close. And Marshall? Box finally turned to look at him. In one of the stasis units in the morgue, I sealed it off with my personal security code. Cass nodded. He needed more time before Zax examined Evie. If Zax woke her up and Evie remembered everything she did... I need you to move Evie and all her victims into the stasis units as well, Cass whispered. Why? Box asked. Just trust me, okay? Do it before Zax gets a chance to get a good look at any of them. We don't have time to argue. He didn't mean to sound so frantic, but he knew that's how it came out. Something within Box made a clicking sound. You need to tell me why. Trust me, I'll explain everything later. Just get them in there, fast. Tell Zax you found they were contaminated with something. You realize she already examined Laura's body, right? Cass gritted his teeth. He'd forgotten. Which meant she recognized the wound. But she hadn't said anything yet. Maybe she assumed one of the Athru picked up the blade and attacked the crew with it. Okay, then. Just lock up Evie and say she was contaminated. It's not a lie. It was a stretch, and Zax wasn't stupid. Box might not go for it. For how long? Just a few hours. I've got a senior staff meeting. I'll be back down to explain everything later. Box hesitated. Cass didn't like it either. But if they told everyone Evie killed seven crew members with her own hands, without a reasonable explanation, there would be a full-on mutiny. As a favor to me. Box dropped his metal shoulders. Fine. As a favor to you. Two. As promised, Wolf had organized most of the senior staff into the conference room. The brand new conference room. Cass stepped in, finding it had not only been repaired, but redesigned as well. Larger, more expansive windows sat off to the side, giving them more of a view, while the room was clad in a color scheme of midnight, purple, and gunmetal. The table was black, with gray trim, while all the seats were a shade of violet. "'You guys, uh, change things around,' Cass said, stepping into the space." Wolf stood off to the side while Zenfor occupied a place near the back wall of the room. Some things never changed. Already, Tyler, River, Rond, and Raffenkel were in the room. At first, Cass didn't recognize Tyler. He'd grown a thick beard of red, which now had streaks of gray throughout. He looked older than Cass was. Considering what had happened, that was possible. Just as he was about to start, the doors opened behind him, and Ensign Talia stepped in her eyes scanning the room. Take a seat, Anson, Cass said. Wolf gave him a strange look, but he ignored it. Unfortunately, the captain is still under observation, and the medical staff can't be here due to all the injuries we're dealing with. I want to get a breakdown of where we are and where we go from here. Cass took the lead seat as Wolf had left it open for him. For those of you who weren't with us on the planet... We found the alien species threatening the Coalition. They call themselves the Athru, and they are highly advanced. Enough so, 
our theories about the ship we encountered at Omicron Terminus were correct. They used time bubbles to obscure their ships from normal space-time. They were the cause of the time distortion we all experienced upon landing. And it was their machines which created this 18-year gap between when we left and when we returned. We learned they can be killed, but they are tough and fast. They have technology far beyond our capability, perhaps even beyond that of the Sill. He glanced up to Zenfor, who remained stone-faced. This may be a moot point, Wolf said. But did you find anything about their plans for the Coalition? The captain did. As soon as she's awake, I'm sure she'll make a full report, Cass replied, wondering how that was going to go. But we also had a lot of casualties on the ground. He nodded to Raffenkel, who'd been part of Wave 1. We lost quite a few crew at the time between when Wave 1 landed and when we landed behind them. And we lost some more to the Athru. I haven't had time to do a full count yet. Thirty-four, Raffenkel said, her voice gravelly. Cass nodded. Sounds about right. Including both of our tactical officers. We'll need to find someone who can take the posting in the meantime. He looked at Talia, who until this point had been staring out the large windows. Cass cleared his throat. Oh, she said, looking around as if she'd just arrived. I mean... I'd be happy to step in until... Great. Problem solved, Cass said. That was one less issue off his back. Talia was their lead in the weapons room, and probably the next best thing they had to a tactical officer. He only hoped she could handle it. Cass turned to Wolf, indicating he was done. Right, she said. Well, as you all know, we've been up here quite a while. Repairs on the ship took longer than expected, but we managed to mine the planet's rings once we got minimal propulsion back up and running, with the help of the remaining space wings. I decided not to... Raffenkel coughed, interrupting. Cass couldn't tell if it was on purpose or not. Wolf continued. I decided not to follow waves one and two down when we didn't know what happened, so we focused our efforts on repairing the ship... The major repairs were done within four seasons, which was longer than we would have liked. Everyone had to cycle in and out of the stasis units. We had no idea how long we'd be up here. I stayed out most of the time, Tyler said, to help take care of, um... He nodded towards Zenfor, looking like he wished he hadn't spoken up. What? Cass asked. What's going on? It seems, Zenfor said, stepping forward... Sester has entered a hibernation state, or perhaps a coma. I don't know which. All I know is I can't reach him anymore. Cass furrowed his brow. Wait a minute. Sester is in a coma? Whatever the Claxian equivalent is. Nurse Mankel did all he could, but he's been like that for nearly ten years. But you said you repaired the engines, Cass said, alarmed. Without Sester, they couldn't operate the undercurrent drive. They couldn't get back. That's true, we did. But we can't use it, not without him, she replied, calm. Zax might find something Minkle missed, but in the meantime, we're stuck here with him like this. I don't understand, Cass said. What happened to make him do that? He was growing increasingly erratic, Tyler said. I think it might have something to do with how far we are from his own people. Claxians aren't usually cut off like this. But he couldn't even speak to another Claxian, much less touch them. They're very social people, which is why most never leave Claxia prime. Cass turned to Zenfor. You didn't see this coming? I saw it, but there was nothing I could do. I don't know if there was anything he could do. It was almost involuntary. Cass sat back in his chair. No Sester, which meant no way back. He and Evie had shared a connection of sorts. Perhaps if she was awake, she might be able to revive him. But that meant admitting to everyone what she had done. That might be possible if they were back in the Coalition. But out here on the frontier, who knew what the crew's reaction would be? Okay, keep going. 
What about contacting the Coalition? The communications array took a little longer, Wolf said. We figured we might as well rebuild the thing while we were stuck here. At least get some updates and maybe warn them about Andra... Sorry, the Athru coming. By the time Zenfor and Tyler had finished reconstructing it and had it pointed home, we got nothing back. We don't know what's going on. There have been no Mayday messages, no asks for assistance, no ships. It's dead quiet of the Coalition. What about the Sill? Cass asked. Unknown. The comm unit doesn't reach that far without the repeaters in Coalition space, Zenfor said. Right. Cass rubbed both his hands down his face. Okay. Anything else? The good news is the ship is self-sufficient again. Our power levels are full, and we've stockpiled a surplus of supplies. And Zenfor has upgraded almost every system on the ship from weapons to power management to filter efficiency. The ship is ready. The smile on her face was terse, but Cass could tell she was proud. They'd spent the better part of two decades working on rebuilding this ship from scratch and had succeeded. If it looked like this ship would be his home for the rest of his life, he would have spent a lot of time upgrading it, too. Our primary goal, then, should be to find a way to operate the engines without Sester, Cass said. Without Sester? Tyler scoffed. He's been the linchpin to this whole... I know, Lieutenant, but there must be a way... Now that the crew is reunited, we need to find a solution. We need to return to Coalition space, even if we're 18 years too late. And what happens when we find nothing but a bunch of dead stars and blown up planets, Raffenkel said. What then? Hopefully by then, the captain will have recovered and she can make a determination, Cass replied, his voice stern. He didn't like how combative her tone was. Raffenkel huffed and strode out of the room before he could call her back. Zenfor cut her eyes to the door. He waved her off. Just let her go. Everyone is bound to be on edge. Is there anything else? What about this accident? It was a routine repair job, Wolf said. But there were microfactures in the ship's hull we didn't detect because we turned the sensors off in that section. Four of the crew were in there including Ensign Jackson. Her voice wavered just enough for Cass to notice. He decided this wasn't the time or the place to press her about it. He'd read the reports and speak to Wolf later about the situation. Okay, Cass said. I want updates from all the department heads within the hour. He turned to Wolf. You're first officer until the captain recovers. Make a shipwide announcement that everyone get reacclimated with a new ship and any questions should be brought to the heads. This is going to take some time for people to get used to, but I have no doubt this crew can do it. Wolf nodded, apparently happy to take the orders. The only reason Cass wasn't handing over control of the ship to her was because of Evie. He still wasn't sure how to handle that situation. Should he tell everyone what happened on the surface, she'd be thrown to the brig for sure, and him along with her. Wolf would take command. Or maybe Raffenkel. There could even be a power struggle. And Cass wanted nothing to do with any of it. They needed to get back to the Coalition in one piece and find out what happened. But he couldn't keep Evie in stasis forever. Zax was probably already suspicious of Box. He needed to get back down there, check on Zal, and figure out how to handle this. If there's nothing else? He glanced around the room. No one else spoke up. Okay, then. Dismissed. Three. When Cass walked back into sickbay, it was a lot quieter. Many of the former patients had been released, including Jan. Box and the other nurses still tended to some of the more serious cases, and Box still hadn't made any repairs to his superstructure. When he saw Cass, his eyes lit up brighter. Oh, thank all that is metal and holy, you're back. The doc has been asking about the captain. She had to go back to work on Zal some more, and she's got Amargosa in there helping with his metal apparatus. What did you tell her? Cass asked. Exactly the script you said, that she'd been infected with something, 
and until we could figure out what, she needed to remain sedated. He leaned in closer, dropping his voice. But she's not stupid. She knows something's up. Cass pulled him away from his patient, so they were off to the side by themselves. We can't exactly just wake her up. As soon as she remembers what she did, she'll lose it. Remember how bad I was after Susanna? That was irrational, and we weren't even going out. Imagine what it will be like for her, knowing she killed the woman she loved. Wait a second. Are you saying all humans have that much guilt about their actions? That doesn't seem... Look, I know her, okay? She's going to have a hard time with it, and this ship needs a capable captain. I can't do it, because I'm not even an officer. And I'm afraid what might happen if I even suggest the possibility to Wolf. I wish there was a way to wake her up without having her remember anything. Technically, there is, but it's tricky, Box said. Cass's mind had wandered, searching for possibilities of how they could handle the situation. But Box's words snapped him from his thoughts. What do you mean? I mean, there is a way to modify her memory. But like I said, it's tricky, and historically hasn't always worked. What hasn't always worked? Cass glanced over to see Zax approaching them, rubbing all four of her hands together with an auto-sanitizer. Doctor? How was Zal? Cass stood just a little straighter. He felt like he'd been caught cheating on a test. Physically, we managed to save his body. But he was close to death. Far closer than I would have liked. But right now, he's stable and sleeping. I haven't woken him up yet, so I'm not sure how he's feeling. As far as I can tell, he didn't suffer any brain damage due to the lack of atmosphere. If he hadn't had his apparatus, though... She didn't need to finish. Cass understood. Will he be able to use it again? Dr. Amargosa is working on it as we speak. She's assured me she can return it to perfect working order in a few days. I was skeptical until I saw our raw materials. Until then, it will be best to return Zal to his quarters, assuming they remain unchanged from when we left. Cass would have to add that to his list of things to check. He recalled Zal had certain special features in his quarters that were comfortable for his species. I'll check with Wolf and Zenfor. They've made so many other changes. Yes, I've noticed, Zack said, taking in sickbay. Happily, my virus collection remains undamaged. She turned to Box. Amargosa wants to see you when she's done. She'll need to begin your repairs. He backed up a step. Oh, no. Last time I let that woman anywhere near me, she almost had me in my component pieces. She's not touching a servo on my body. And if she tries, I'll break every finger in her hands. And then, he added cheerfully, treat her injuries with care. Because that's what I do. I'm a caregiver. Which reminds me, I think someone owes me a commendation. Box, Cass said, you need repairs. I can personally assure you Amargosa won't do anything. No way. Forget it. Box raised his voice. I'll do it myself. You can't reach half of your injuries. Cass knew what was coming, and he doubted he had a choice in the matter. Then you need to make the repairs. I don't trust anyone else to do it. And there it is. He tapped the back of his hand, activating his comm. Consul, could you meet me in sick bay, please? In a few moments, Zenfor said, then cut the line. Box's eye blinked a pattern Cass had only seen a few times before. He was intrigued. Ooh, exotic. I like it. Perhaps she can give me a powered-up sill weapon that can burn a hole right through a person. He glanced at Zax. For purely entertainment purposes, of course. Of course, she said, returning her attention to Cass. Now, what's this about memory? Cass's face turned crimson. Oh, uh... I was just talking to Box in hypotheticals, as in what was possible as far as memory removal. Memories can't be removed, Zack said, her voice clipped. They can only be obscured. But it is a highly unethical process. 
unless the patient's life is on the line. Cass leaned forward. What sort of circumstances would require that kind of procedure? In some cases of extreme trauma, such as events that could lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, occasionally the trauma can be so overwhelming the individual ceases to function. It's rare, but it has been done in the past. Why are you so interested? Cass scrambled for an explanation. I guess I just have some parts of my past I'd rather not remember. I'm sorry to hear that, but messing with your memories is not a good idea. If it isn't done properly, the relapse can be worse than the original trauma. Even I wouldn't be comfortable performing such a procedure. Cass tried to think of something else to ask, to maybe even suggest Evie might be a good candidate for such a procedure. But he could tell from Zax's tone she'd never go for it. From the moment Box had suggested it, the seed had grown in Cass's mind. If Zax couldn't do the procedure, there had to be another way. It was the only way to save Evie from going through all that pain and turmoil as a result of her actions. And at the same time, she would be able to function without all that baggage. If they could obscure all traces of her memory with that other being in her mind, it would also alleviate his concerns about her flying off the handle again. Because, as it was right now, he didn't trust to wake her up. What if the other one was there in her place instead and just started stabbing people? The doors to sickbay opened to reveal Zenfor, her expression neutral. Consul, Cass said, approaching her. Box needs repairs. Do you think you can assist? She glanced at the robot, taking in his limp arm, his dark eye, and all of his other injuries. Of course. We used to have mechanical servants on Thisleia. The repairs shouldn't take long at all. Mechanical servant? Box asked, indignant. Just go with her. She's not going to change her personality or remove anything crucial, right? He asked, staring at Zenfor. Why would I do that? She asked. I can't go. I have patients, duties. Box made a move to return to the patient he'd been tending when Cass walked in. I'll take care of your patients, Zax replied. Now that Zol is stable, I have some free hands. She held up two of her arms, wiggling the fingers at the ends. Fine, Box huffed, but I want my medal. He turned to Zen for. Make a spot for it right here. It's where I plan to mount it. I want it to be so bright it blinds people when I walk in the room. Zenfor glanced at Cass before escorting Box out of sickbay. He had to hand it to her. When he left the ship a few days ago, she never would have agreed to work with Box. But all this time with the ship had mellowed her mood. Still, Cass had about 18 years of reports to catch up on as soon as he found the time. Commander, we need to talk, Zack said, bringing his attention back to her. About the captain. Right. Cass waited for her to go first. He didn't need to volunteer any extra information. If Zax wasn't willing to modify Evie's memories, then it was best he kept her in the dark. Plus, if Zax couldn't do it, he bet Box could. All he'd need to do would be to read up on others who had performed the procedure in the past. That was, if they decided to do it at all. He hadn't liked what Zax had said about the potential dangers, Box tells me she was exposed to some kind of virus? Zax's sparkling eyes regarded him, and he found it difficult to look into them. Without irises, Yak's Inax were difficult to read. He couldn't even be sure she wasn't looking at something else. It was in the temple, but no one realized it until after she left. What kind of virus? Zax asked. She leaned in, and Cass realized he'd only piqued her interest. She wasn't going to let this go. I don't know, he lied. But it caused her to act erratically, not like herself. And I didn't think that it was a good idea to introduce her back to the ship in that state. No, no, that was a good call. Zax rubbed her chin, deep in thought. So I'd like to get her out of stasis as soon as possible to get a look at what's going on inside. I might be able to figure out the nature of this virus perhaps even add her to my collection when she's free of it. Inside, Cass cringed. 
As soon as Zax got her on a diagnostic table, she'd figure out Evie didn't have any virus. Instead, she'd acted of her own accord down to the planet. Evie would wake up, remember everything, and lose it. Or she'd wake up as an alien personality, hell-bent on killing them all. Then not only would her sanity be in question, but the leadership of the crew would be too, and things would fall apart. Cass had seen it in the Sargan Commonwealth more than once. As soon as the internal structure began to give, people grew selfish very quickly. And if they were going to return to the Coalition, not knowing what situation it might be in, they needed to be fully united and strong. That's a good idea. But you need to rest too, Doc, Cass said, hoping he could convince her. You've been running nonstop since we landed on that planet, and I need you at your best before you tackle another huge project. The captain isn't going anywhere. You can examine her tomorrow. Zack sighed. I suppose you're right. I have been running on Cluckleton for the past few days. When she saw his confused face, she smiled. It's the Yaks Inax equivalent of adrenaline. Once we get going, our system naturally secretes it to keep us up and mobile for days at a time. But it takes a toll. She glanced back at the surgery ward. I suppose some rest couldn't hurt. James? Nurse Mangle came jogging over from an adjacent part of sickbay. The last time Cass had seen him, he'd been at least five years younger. But the lines on his face betrayed the fact he'd been on the ship much longer than he should have. Ma'am? I'm taking a few hours off. Keep an eye on this place for a while? Yes, ma'am, Mangle said. Cass breathed a sigh of relief as she gave them both a nod and exited through the main doors. Cass turned to Mankel. So, how long did you stay out? Mankel pursed his lips and took a deep breath. 2,575 days. Longest six years of my life. Then he returned to his duties. As Cass watched him work, he wasn't sure what he'd met. But he didn't like the sound of it. Four. It seemed most of the crew had adapted well to the strange situation they'd found themselves in. But Cass wasn't surprised. After all, they'd faced interdimensional creatures, time-shifted aliens, and made a temporary alliance with one of the Coalition's most deadly enemies together. What was another obstacle to overcome? Old friends reunited as if no time had passed at all, which for some of them it hadn't. Most of the crew who had remained on the ship seemed happy to have the rest of the crew back, even if they hadn't aged. As Cass skimmed over the reports on his way to the base to check on the supply situation, what surprised him was how the crew that had remained aboard hadn't done more for their personal lives. While a few people had begun relationships, at least according to the reports, no one had opted to begin families during their exile. He supposed this was because most people were only outside the stasis units for weeks at a time, which would make having children problematic. But in the same vein, it was difficult to imagine 18 years passing with precious little to show for it. Sure, they had rebuilt the ship from scratch, but was that enough? But then he was one to talk. Wasn't that what he'd done back when he'd been working for Vina? Most of his days had been the same, and he'd had little option to change them. Had it been like that aboard Tempest? Why hadn't the crew decided enough was enough and stopped waiting? What was he missing here? It was like the crew knew he and the others would return. Once he got this Evie situation ironed out, he'd need to investigate. And he still needed to investigate Marshall's background. He had to hope he'd been the only spy aboard. When he reached the bay, he was glad to see most of the supplies had been offloaded by the crew and the gravity assist movers. They'd probably need to take a look at both the shuttles and the space wings to make sure they hadn't undergone any kind of degradation passing through the planet's atmosphere. But that could wait until later. What he was looking for wasn't in this part of the bay. Cass crossed over to the adjacent hangar where they kept the space wing squadron and already saw most of the pilots hard at work disassembling and checking their ships though four of the spaces were now empty, once occupied by ships they'd left back on the planet by necessity. 
At least they hadn't lost any more pilots, for which he was grateful. But he was sure it was just one more thing Raffenkel could blame on him. Glancing around, he didn't see any sign of her, which was lucky on his part. He approached Jan's fighter. It was easy to distinguish due to all the extra firepower which had been added onto the superstructure, where the pilot herself and Ryan were in the middle of pulling off the ship's plating. Feeling better? Cass asked. Much, she replied, without turning around. I knew those bears would be the end of me. She told me what happened, Ryan said, excitement in his voice. Man, would I have liked to have seen that. You say that now. But when one of those bastards is staring you down with their huge black eyes, charging you at twenty kilometers per hour, you tend to lose all sense of wonder. Jan grunted, and the plating pulled away. She tossed it to the side, examining the guts of the ship. Kind of like our commander here, in spiders. Ryan cocked an eyebrow at Cass. It's nothing, Cass said. Jan chuckled, still focused on the ship's interior. Damn I, Averone. He blew two of my fuel regulators. I told him he couldn't push this thing like his own ship. Cass turned his attention to Ryan. I need to ask you something. Did anything odd happen while we were away? Ryan creased his brow. Odd? Other than spending 18 years waiting for you to get back? Yeah, like anything you'd find strange or unusual. He shook his head. No. But then again, I was asleep for most of it. They didn't wake me up often, only when they needed some extra space. How often? In the beginning, it was every four weeks or so. I'd stay out for a week, then go back in. But then there was a long stretch after about two years. I was under for almost ten years straight before they woke me up again. Ten years straight? That didn't sound right. Did they tell you why? He shrugged. Lieutenant Tyler said it was because they hadn't needed space in a while. But Nurse Mankel wanted me out so we could do some routine medical scans, make sure nothing was in the process of atrophy. And was it? Cass noticed Jan turned toward the conversation. She'd stopped working on the ship. Ryan shook his head again. Nope, everything was fine. After ten years, Cass trailed off. Something about that seemed wrong. Their stasis units were good, but even in stasis, the body experienced a minuscule amount of decay. After that long, it should have built up. Unless Zenfor modified those too, which wasn't outside the realm of possibility. Did you include that in your report? Wolf told me it wasn't a big deal, he replied. But I made some footnotes anyway. They're in my personal logs, just not the official stuff. And that didn't strike you as strange? Something was wrong here. What could have happened that they needed to keep Ryan in storage for a decade? At the time, not really. I was just happy I hadn't wasted a huge amount of time. Plus, after that, they had me up every four weeks again. And I finally got to take my ship out for some practice. Must have blasted at least a thousand asteroids in the planet's rings. Cass, what's wrong? Jan asked. He shook his head. I don't know. Something about all this doesn't add up. The ship is in perfect condition, but we've got four dead crew members, a chief engineer in a coma, and Ryan lost over a decade. Something's going on. His calm chirped. Cass here. Hey, boss. All patched up. You were right. She did a fantastic job. Better than you ever did. She's agreed to be my new emergency contact. Don't take it personally. But I have to do what's best for me. Great, Cass said, ignoring him. Meet me back in sickbay in five minutes. We need to finish that experiment. Exper- Oh, right. See you in a few. Box cut the comm. Experiment? Jan asked. On something from the surface, Cass replied. That reminds me, Jan said. Aren't you worried about the captain? What happens when she wakes up and that thing is still in her head? 
Her dark blue eyes seemed to be staring right through him. She assured me she had it under control. I'm hoping it won't be a problem anymore. He didn't need Jan getting involved, too. This was already precarious as it was. What are we talking about? Ryant asked. Sorry, Cass said, before Jan could say anything. Classified. He stared at Jan to make sure he got his point across. She turned back to the ship, pulling hoses out from the guts of the ship. Well, damn. Now I really wish I'd gone. I could have kept my youth. And gotten in on some sweet classified intel. Jan snorted in response. If you think of anything else that stands out to you while we were gone, you'll let me know? Cass backed away from them. He needed to get back to sickbay. They wouldn't have a lot of time before Zax returned from her rest cycle. Cass wasn't even sure how long a Yak's Inex rest cycle was. Yeah, if anything comes to mind, you'll be the first to know, Ryan said, giving him a wave before helping Jan rip out part of the space wing. Cass waited for her to say something or make some acknowledgement he was leaving, but she just continued to work on the ship, not saying a word. When Cass returned to sick bay, Box was already there, performing quick checks of the patients. For a moment, he forgot the robot had even been damaged. All his parts were shiny and new, and Cass couldn't find one servo out of place. When Box turned to him, both his eyes were bright and yellow, just like they were supposed to be. You weren't kidding, he said. She did a number on you. All of it purely superficial, Box replied. I made sure she didn't access any of my ports. Unlike some people. Cass dismissed him. That was for your own good, and you know it. If I hadn't, you'd be a rage-fueled killing machine right now. How do you know I'm not? That all the anger isn't just bubbling up under the surface, and all your attempts to alter my programming were unsuccessful. He leaned down, so his face was right in Cass's. Because if you had, the minute Lieutenant Rond or Page had you cornered, you would have torn them in half. Since neither happened, I assumed you were fine. Box leaned back. Huh. Well, maybe I just wanted you to think. Cash shushed him. Can we get on with this, please? I don't want Zax to come back while we're in the middle of the procedure. Yes. By the way, I'm not doing it, Box whispered. Cass stared at him. It's the only way we can wake up the captain without dealing with all the fallout. I don't care. Box followed him back to the morgue. Zack said the memory thing was bad. Remember? Only to be used in life-or-death situations? This is a life-or-death situation. Think about it. If she wakes up with all those memories intact, what's the first thing she's going to do? Box shrugged. Grieve? Or kill? If it is grief, it could threaten to overwhelm everything else. And then, all of a sudden, there are questions about not only Laura, but the other crew member she, you know, while she was under the influence of that thing. I need you to remove all memory of not only the alien, but Laura as well. Wait a second, Box said, maneuvering himself in front of Cass. I get the alien, but why Laura? Cass huffed with frustration. Because they're tied together. And if she knows what she did to her... Trust me, it'll be bad. He moved around Box to reach the wall of shells with bodies inside. Which one? I don't know, boss. I've never done anything like that before. What if I mess her up forever? I'm sorry. Was that the great and powerful Box telling me he can't do something? There's a job too complex for his infinite skill and intellect? Something too hard? Cass wasn't playing fair, and he knew it. But this was what was best for everyone. And if Box needed a little emotional manipulation to figure that out, then so be it. Of course I can do it. Box blinked rapidly. There. Just downloaded the entire Coalition database on the subject. Oh, he said, looking off into the distance. Oh, this is complex. Only a few surgeons have been successful. Apparently, memory is a tricky thing. It isn't about obscuring a single person or event. It's about suppressing the feelings associated with that event. Human memories are rooted in emotion, quite unlike myself. You have everything you need? 
Cass asked, too eager. We have a synaptic scanner on board, as well as an engram locator. I shouldn't need anything else. But this will be some delicate work. He focused back on Cass again. Are you sure we should be doing this? My oath is on the line here. Trust me, Cass said. This will help save her life. And I'm not saying we keep the memories from her forever. But things need to stabilize first. Assuming we get the engines back online, we can't be headed straight for possibly a war-torn coalition with a captain on the brink of a mental breakdown. Box hesitated. Look, we both know her. We know what she did wasn't her. But do you think Wolf or even Zax are going to see it that way? Do you think any of the admirals back home would understand that? He stared up into his friend's eyes, pleading. No, they probably wouldn't, Box replied, his metal shoulders dropping. He reached out and tapped a complex 64-digit code into the panel beside one of the drawers, and it clicked. He pulled it out, and with a hiss, Evie's body emerged on the drawer, white mist rising from the seal break. I'll need to get her into the surgical bay. Will it need to be invasive? Cass asked. He hadn't considered needing to open her up. No, but I need to lock her body down so she doesn't move during the procedure. An errant muscle spasm could lobotomize her. He reached over and lifted the shelf out without straining and walked her through to the far section of sick bay where the surgical studio was. Inside, Cass saw remnants of blue cloth on the floor where they'd cut away Zal's robes and hadn't yet cleaned them up. As soon as he got the clear from Zax, he'd go check on the ship's operations officer. This can work, Box said, once she was on the table and restrained by the suspension field. But the reason most of these fail is because memory is so interconnected. If anyone mentions Laura or anything to do with her, it could potentially trigger the block and undo everything I'm about to obscure. Fortunately, I don't think many people knew how close they were, Cass said. I've already got tactical covered, so hopefully no one says anything that sets her off. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio. Someone could mention it one day, and it would have no effect on her, and mention it again the following day, and it completely blow the obfuscation. That's what I'm saying. There's no guarantees. Cass stared at Evie's face. It was the same one that had been twisted into a grimace as she tried to kill both him and Box under the influence of that thing. He hadn't seen her when she attacked the others, but he imagined she looked similar. They must have been terrified as they watched her come at them with that sword. And while he felt for his fallen crew members, he couldn't sacrifice the potential safety of the ship to bring them justice. Perhaps one day he could, but now was not the time. I understand. Remove all memory of Laura, or at least their relationship together, and all memory of what happened to the temple. If she doesn't remember that thing, maybe it won't be able to come back. I'll do what I can, Box replied, preparing his equipment. 5. Confusing dreams, strange images. It was hard to make anything out. In that gray space between when she'd been completely out and when she realized she was conscious, something deep and sharp penetrated Evie's thoughts. But it was gone faster than she could register what it had been. All she knew was when she opened her eyes, she felt like something was wrong. The light in the room was much too bright, and she closed her eyes halfway again until she could adjust. She reached up with her hand, only to find it restrained at her side. For a second, she felt a jolt of panic and something cold against her back, like stone, until she realized she was back on the ship. She was in sickbay and blinked a few times as the faces of Box and Cass came into view and a moan escaped her lips. Her head pounded. What is going on? I can't move. Box dropped the field. Her body seemed to bounce up with the suspension field no longer holding her down. At least that made sense. But she didn't understand how she could be back on the ship. They'd had to leave the ship because life support was running low. They'd gone down to the planet. First wave one, then wave two. 
Edie? Are you okay? Cass asked, his head blocking out some of the light. I don't know. Something feels wrong. Why am I here? What happened? Her head hurt and was foggy at the same time. She was having a difficult time remembering anything. Images floated through her mind, but when she tried to concentrate on them, they slipped through her grasp. Help her up, Cass said, and she felt long, cold fingers slide under her back as Box lifted her into a sitting position. Her head swam as she sat on the edge of the bed, and for a moment she thought she might faint. She pitched forward, but Cass was there and held her up by the shoulders. She was keenly aware of her unbound hair falling back over her shoulders. There was an incident on the surface, Cass said. What's the last thing you remember? She squinted, trying to recall where she'd been before now, but some of it felt like a dream. She couldn't be sure. Where had she been? In the jungle? Tracking the shuttle? That sounded right. At least, somewhat right. Looking for the uh, Honduras. You were attacked, do you remember? A flash of red streaked across her vision. Then another flash. Something awful had happened in that jungle. Something she couldn't recall. Or something she didn't want to. Kind of. Why am I back on the ship? Where are we? We're still in orbit around the planet, Cass said. But everything is okay. The ship has been repaired, and we're all safe. Evie rubbed her forehead. The ship? Repaired? How long were we down there? Every word out of her mouth hurt. She felt like she needed to sleep for a week. A while, Cass said. She glanced up to see a strange look across his face. He was holding something back. Cass, don't fuck with me. How long? I'm going to take that as a good sign, Box said. She could hear him putting equipment away, but trained her focus on her first officer. Her thoughts were becoming clearer, and the pounding had abated. That all depends on how you look at it. We were only on the surface of the planet for about 20 hours or so. But because of the time difference, 18 years passed on the ship. She shot up from the bed, losing her footing before grabbing the side of the next bed over and holding herself up. 18 years? Is this planet orbiting a black hole we didn't know about? No, it's the alien's technology. It allows them to manipulate time fields, Cass said. We found and destroyed one of their devices on the planet. But we didn't realize that by doing that, time around the planet became erratic. Statistically, we were lucky to emerge when we did, Box chimed in. We could have come out before the ship even arrived at the planet, or thousands of years in the future, finding nothing but a ship full of corpses. It was quite good luck. Evie pushed herself along the bed, noticing the new decor, as well as some upgrades someone had taken the time to install. What's our status? Cass followed along, wisely not trying to help her as she grew more sure-footed. As she emerged from the suite into sick bay, she caught sight of other crewmen still in the beds. What about the crew? Did everyone get back? Something red flashed across her vision again, and she had to steady herself again. Unfortunately, no, Cass said. We lost some good people on the surface. How many? She'd stopped, trying to get her head to clear. Thirty-four. She turned to him, incredulous. Thirty-four? By core. Look, I'll explain everything as soon as you're feeling better, Cass said. But we needed to make sure you were okay first. He still had that strange look on his face, the one that made her suspect he was holding something back. Why wouldn't I be okay? What happened to me? She ran her hands over her arms, her stomach, her head, feeling nothing out of place. No new abrasions or bandages. What was he talking about? Cass hesitated. You were attacked. We just needed to make sure... The image of a woman with her torso torn apart appeared in Evie's mind and took hold. She cried out and dropped to her knees, holding her hands out, 
just as she'd held on to her lifeless body. I told you, she's relapsing. It's not holding, Box said. Just wait a second, Cass said. But she barely hurt either one of them. All she could think of was the woman she'd held in her arms as she died. How could she have forgotten? Oh, Karen, I'm so sorry. So, so sorry. Cass knelt beside her. What happened? he asked. We, we were ambushed. It was too fast. First it took out Williams, then Carson and Vostokov. At the end, it was just me and Uma. And then it opened her up like a piece of tin, and I held her as she died. Evie glanced down to her clothes. They were clean and neat. No trace of her former tactical officer's blood anywhere. I tried to stop it, but I couldn't. You did your best, Cass said, placing his hand on Evie's shoulder. They were too fast for most of us. Who? she asked. All she remembered was being knocked out. Who was it? Andromeda, Cass said. We found them down there. Or, more accurately, they found us. What happened? Cass glanced up at Box, who had appeared on the other side of her, and they helped her back up. After we had gone looking for Wave 1, we arrived at the shuttle's location where we found you, Cass said, unconscious on the ground beside what was left of Lieutenant Uma. They just left me alone? Evie asked. Why? Cass shrugged. I'm not sure. But we couldn't wake you up, so Box had to carry you back to our camp. They attacked not long after that. With some ingenuity, we managed to fend them off and get airborne again. How did you manage to break the dampening field? Evie asked. When I left camp, there wasn't any power. We still couldn't move the shuttles or access all our equipment. Her eyes went wide. What about Zal? Was he... He's fine, Cass said. We got him back to the ship just in time. It'll be a few days, but he's going to be okay. She took a breath of relief. At least he'd made it. But 34 others? How could she have let that happen? What kind of captain was she? Fox managed to find the device they were using to disrupt our electrical fields and disable it, Cass said. He's got a built-in homing device he didn't know about. Oh, yeah, you should have seen it. Caspian just opened me up like a virgin on her honeymoon and went to town, Box said. Ahem, Cass said. After that, we took off, planning to head for the Bulak hub. But when we got back in orbit, we found we didn't need to. As you can see, the ship is doing better than ever. Because we're 18 years in the future, Evie said. Right, I mean, pretty much. She stared at his face. Other than bags under his eyes from lack of sleep, he looked the same as he had the last time she'd seen him, going off into the woods with his team for Wave 1, while Marshall... Evie furrowed her brow. She had the sudden urge to speak to Marshall, as if he had something important to tell her. Why were all her thoughts so jumbled... She was jumping from one to another to another, like a frog crossing lily pads. Maybe all this was just a side effect of her injury, which he also didn't understand. Where's Marshall? I need to speak to him. Cass dropped his eyes, telling her everything she already needed to know. Killed in action. Damn it. She never should have allowed him to help patrol the camp. He wasn't military, and he'd gone and gotten himself killed, along with all the rest. Captain Green was probably rolling in a shelf at the moment. She reset herself, raising her head high. I need status updates. A list of casualties and the situation back home. If the ship is repaired, how are the engines? Can we get back? You need to take it easy for a few days, Box said. You suffered some trauma, and it will take some time before you begin to feel like yourself again. Until then, you'll need some rest. I don't have time to rest, she countered. I need to get us home. Has there been any word from the Coalition? Cash shook his head. But I'm still going over the reports myself. Why don't we take some time to go over everything at the command room? 
A lot has happened, and that way we can catch up at the same time. Sure, she said, almost as if she was out of breath. Let's do that. She glanced around the room, looking for her sword. Have you seen my... She made a motion of swiping through the air with her hand. Cass looked over to Box, then back to her. It's back in your room, with the rest of your effects. Good. For a second there, I was afraid you were going to say it was lost. Something passed over Cass's eyes, but she couldn't tell what. He was being so cagey. Maybe it was just her messed up brain. Like Box said, maybe she'd feel better in a few days. Okay, let's get started. Six. The meeting dragged on for hours. And by the time it was over, Evie felt like her brain had been blended into a mushy pulp. She couldn't wrap her mind around everything that had happened since her accident. The casualty report was exhaustive. Not only did they lose Uma and Marshall, but the entire crew of the Honduras, half the security forces, and about seven people from Wave 1. Not to mention the four people that died on the ship while they were away. Cass had explained how Wave 3 had never followed them to the planet and had instead traded off time of the stasis units until the life support was fixed enough so they could all be out at once. That had lasted about six months, until they had realized everyone from the surface wasn't returning any time soon. Wolf had suggested they limit the amount of time outside of stasis to minimize how much time passed for each of them, though it seemed some had stayed out of stasis longer than others, with Lieutenant Tyler staying out the longest at twelve years. But the worst news was about Sester. Even though she and Cass read the reports together, they couldn't understand what had happened to him. It seemed one day he just cut off contact with everyone, including Zenfor. The following day, he was in a self-induced coma. Evie hadn't even known that was possible. But then again, there was still a lot about the Klaxians they didn't know, despite them being founding members of the Coalition. Of greater concern was the lack of communication with the Coalition. All compulses had either been ignored or never received despite the ship's antennas working again, which didn't bode well. Before they left for the surface, they had known Andromeda was on its way, even if they couldn't detect them. But now they couldn't take any chances. She had to assume 18 years ago Andromeda made it to Coalition space and brought the fight with them. Did the Sill assist, or did they just sit by and watch? What about the Sargan Commonwealth? Evie couldn't imagine they would have just stood by and watched the Coalition be torn apart. Most of the Sargans had been part of the Coalition at some point, going back a few hundred years. Despite the bad blood between the factions, they'd never seen a threat like Andromeda. The Sargans had to know if they sat back and did nothing, they'd be next. There was just no telling until they went to see for themselves. I'm just finding this hard to believe. That we could have been down there for that long, Evie said, reading the same reports from Wolf over and over again. I mean, I get why Wolf didn't come down, but she could have at least sent a probe, some kind of message telling us what was going on. As far as we can tell, and this is just an estimate, the 18 years passed in less than an hour for us down there. While we were in the middle of trying to fend off the camp from a hostile force, even if she'd sent a message, I doubt we'd have seen or received it. Evie shoved away from the desk and stood like she had a purpose. Fucking time travel. I knew. The moment we found that stupid arch, I knew this was going to be a problem. But there's nothing we can do about it now. Is there? He scoffed. What? You mean like going back down to the planet and trying to turn it backward? No, I don't think it works like that. Even if we manage to return to the planet in one piece, we've already interacted with the future. The minute we left the atmosphere, we became part of this time period. She stared out the window of the command room, the very edge of the green planet's rings visible through the clear material. I had to at least ask. Evie turned back to him. I need to speak to Zenfor. Maybe she can tell me something else about Sester, 
something she wouldn't have put in the reports. Cass laid his tablet on the table between them. Such as? I don't know. But she and I share a bond with Sester no one else on the ship understands. She might not have wanted to include something because it was private. The planet beyond turned slowly, its rings widening as their angle of view shifted. Evie cursed the planet and the species that had come from it. She couldn't understand how they could be so advanced and yet have come from such a rural place. No stations in orbit, no cities, no collections of technology of any kind. Where had they built their ships? None of this added up. You can try, Cass said, his voice casual. But you know her. Getting her to open up about anything is its own challenge. It's worth a shot, Evie said, walking around the table. An anxiousness was gathering inside her, something she couldn't explain. It was like she needed to get something out, otherwise she might burst. But she couldn't explain what it was. All she knew was whatever she'd been hit with down on the planet had royally fucked her up, and she wasn't going to let the aliens get away with it. Leaving her alive would turn out to be their biggest mistake. She strode out on the bridge with Cass close behind. It was amazing what the remaining crew had done while they were gone. But she supposed most anything could be accomplished given enough time. The whole bridge gleamed as if the ship had just come from dry dock. Someone had decided a redecoration in blacks and purples had been in order, and she almost laughed at the thought of Zenfor ordering the crew to remove the standard muted reds and blues the Coalition used in its color design and replace them with something much bolder. Not that she minded. She liked the change of pace. It made Tempest feel a little stronger, a little meaner, like she had teeth and wasn't afraid to show them. All of the stations were in the same places, but had been given upgrades so the controls weren't as bulky or obtrusive. It was more streamlined, cleaner, and more impressive. If there was anyone left at Coalition Central, Evie couldn't wait to see their faces when they came on board. Do you want me to go with you? Cass asked as she turned to the hypervator. No, hold down the fort here. I shouldn't be long. He nodded and headed to his chair, which now sported a new, leaner design, but remained slightly elevated above the rest of the stations, giving it and the captain's chairs a good view of the space. Glad to have you back, Captain, Anson Rivers said from her post at the front of the room. The comet caught Evie off guard. She hadn't bothered addressing the bridge crew when she'd come back, though she didn't know why. Evie supposed perhaps it was because she hadn't felt like she was out for any serious period of time. But according to Cass, it had been significant. Or maybe it just felt like that. She couldn't be sure. Her mind was so jumbled it would be a few days before things felt right again. She wished Sester was here. He could help her work through all this confusion. Thanks, Evie said. I just want to express my appreciation to you all. You've done an amazing job, not only with this ship, but in bringing the crew back together while I was under the weather. No one chuckled even though she thought it was kind of clever, since they'd been down on the planet and all. Perhaps the sting of all those they'd lost was just too much for jokes. Levity wasn't her strong suit. She glanced at each of them in turn, at least to let them know she was sincere. But, of course, Zal wasn't at ops. Instead, it was Lieutenant Handel, and Ensign Talia occupied tactical though Evie found she couldn't hold her gaze like she wanted. After what had happened to Uma, it was difficult to look at the station. She nodded at Cass, then headed for the hypervator. She had a mystery to uncover. When Evie entered engineering, she almost didn't recognize it. Like the rest of the ship, it had been refurbished. It was as if all of engineering had been torn apart and rebuilt from scratch. No longer did the four large undercurrent conduits dominate the room. Instead, it had been split into three open levels surrounding a giant column in the middle of the room, which was all four conduits themselves bundled together. Each level allowed the crew to monitor the conduits at every juncture, giving them the ability to keep an eye on potential issues much sooner. It was a great design, 
and she wasn't sure why the coalition hadn't already adopted it. Behind the new levels was Sester's cradle, and yet it was empty. Sester himself lay off to the side. All five of his long appendages curled up like the back of a snail and folded in on himself. It almost looked like he was dead. She hated to think that way. But along with his pale color, he probably wasn't far from it. She only hoped whatever state he was in would keep him alive long enough for them to figure out what was going on. Zenfor stood at the far side of the second level, her arms crossed as she stared at the bundle of columns. Tyler. Good God, he was a middle-aged man. She barely recognized him beneath the beard. He smiled as she approached, the crow's feet along his eyes telling Evie he was probably a decade older than she was now. Lieutenant, she said, sticking out her hand as she approached. Captain, he replied, taking it. It's been a long time. For one of us. Cass told me you'd stayed out of the stasis units longer than anyone else, but I wasn't expecting you to be so... distinguished? He laughed. It was a hearty laugh, that of someone who developed a good sense of humor over the years. Completely opposite from the young, inexperienced engineer she'd first met when he'd come on board as Cesar's liaison. She found it easy to laugh along with him. Age had cooled his once-hot personality. That's one way of putting it. Evie glanced up to the second level where Zenfor stood. I can't believe what you've done with this place. By moving all the undercurrent conduits to the middle of the room and using them to insulate each other, it improves the engine efficiency by at least 12%, Totter said, excitement lighting up his eyes. And it allows the silt technology Zenfor used to get us here to integrate into the system by mimicking the engines of a sill ship. We've learned so much from her over the years. Enough to fill a hundred technical journals. Evie smiled. I'm glad she's been helpful. Zenfor turned her head, her eyes landing on Evie for a moment, as if she could hear their conversation. Even though Evie knew she couldn't, she was too far away. What can you tell me about Sester? Tyler cast his eyes downward. Nothing that wasn't already in my reports. It was sudden. I wish I knew why. She leaned in. Do you think this is the best place for him? Zen said it was better if he stayed here. That it would help him if he could be near his home on the ship, rather than in some cargo bay. He motioned to the still form of their main engineer. I just hope he gets better. Don't worry, she said, placing a reassuring hand on his shoulder. We'll get it figured out. And we'll find a way back home, I promise. He gave her a curt nod but there was something about his body language that had changed as she said those words. She couldn't identify it, but then again she wasn't as sharp as she needed to be. He returned to his station without another word, and Evie made her way over to the small platform that raised her up to the second level. Zanfor stood five meters away, her arms crossed as she watched the pulsating white energy flow through the undercurrent conduits. Consul, Evie said, approaching her, there's no need to call me that anymore. I doubt I'll be commanding any more sill ships. Her face was like stone, and her eyes remained on the conduits. You don't think the sill would take you back? Surely there must still be a place for you. Cass said your people live much longer than humans. You misunderstand. I don't want to go back. How could I return to a single path in life after tasting so many different avenues? I feared it would kill my soul. Evie was taken aback. She hadn't expected such honesty from the sill. Though this woman was eighteen years wiser than she'd been the last time she'd seen her. There was a softness to her that hadn't been there before, that had been obscured by the hard, angry edges of someone taken away from her people. What about Meles and your family? Meles is dead. She said it with such certainty. Evie thought for a moment she might have received a communication after all. Then she realized Zenfor probably thought the entire coalition, Meles included, had been wiped out. And she might not be wrong. It was something Evie didn't want to dwell on. I need to ask you about Sester. Evie could have sworn Zenfor bristled when she said the Claxian's name. But she pressed on anyway. 
I was hoping you might be able to offer further insight into his condition. The silk cutter rise to Evie, then back to the conduits. I've said all I need to say. I know you and he were very close, and you might not have wanted to put something private in an official report. But since he assisted me with my problems, I thought perhaps there is nothing more to tell. He did not elaborate when he felt ill. There was nothing I could do. It wasn't as if I didn't try. Her clipped tone made Evie think she defended her in some way. I'm not accusing you of anything. I just want... I'm afraid you'll have to deal with your problems on your own. He can't help you anymore, she said, harshness coloring her voice. So that's how it was going to be. Consul, Evie said, hardening her own tone. Don't make this personal. It isn't. My problems are my own. I only want to make sure he is okay and find a way to get my crew back home. I'm sure you'll figure it out, Zenfor replied, then left Evie there by herself, the bright energy pulsing down the conduits beside her. Evie watched her go, walking around the outside of the catwalk, until she came to the far side where Sester's cradle sat. Zenfor gripped the metal handrails and stared down at the inert form of Sester, as if she expected him to wake any second. Evie took a deep breath and returned to the small lift. So much for the softness. She wasn't about to get anything from Zenfor. She'd sensed the woman had never quite liked her. This only confirmed it. She'd get Cass to try again later. Maybe he would have more luck. As she left engineering, she made to wave to Tyler, only to find his back to her. Dropping her gaze, she left through the door, dejected. Seven. It had been over twelve hours since they'd woken Evie, and as far as Cass was concerned, they'd succeeded. And as soon as his guilt had begun in on him, he balled it up, stuffed it in a tiny box, locked it, and shoved it into the deepest corner of his mind. It was obvious obscuring any thoughts of Laura or the alien had been the right call. The ship needed its captain. And despite a few close calls there at the beginning, Evie had come through it just fine. Twelve hours and no mention of a lost love or a creature inhabiting her head controlling her actions. Box's procedure had been a full-on success. Although it had taken some convincing Dr. Zax. Soon after Evie had headed off to engineering to talk to Zent for, a pointless exercise, Cass was sure, he'd headed back to sickbay to begin his damage control. Zax was already there, but with the looks he'd gotten from Box, she hadn't yet checked the bodies in the morgue to see if Evie was still among them. Cass had practiced the entire script in his head and with Box. Based on Zax's concerns, he told Box to go ahead and remove her, to prep her for Zax's examination when the doctor returned from her rest. When Box removed her from the unit and scanned her, he couldn't find any trace of the original virus, all of which was technically true, if they were to think of that thing inside her head as a virus. With no reason to keep her, Cass had ordered Box to wake her and allow her some time to reacclimate. They could explain using the specialized equipment for nothing more than a detailed scan to make sure they hadn't missed anything before she woke up. And while it all fit, Cass couldn't keep his palms from sweating as he'd entered sickbay to see Zax's confused face. He managed to explain the events just as they'd practiced, with Box throwing in a few colorful metaphors for good measure. If Zax had been human, he would have been a lot more confident he'd nailed it. But being Yak Zynax, Cass wasn't sure if her reactions were something he needed to worry about or not. She had accepted the explanation without a word of protest, but it had almost been too easy. He was confident if she thought they had committed a serious breach, she wouldn't hesitate to take action to correct it, such as notify the captain or a security detail. But there was something about Zax that made Cass think maybe she wasn't the upfront and honest person she appeared to be. Maybe it was because of that time of the weapons room when she caught him and Zenfor loading the transdimensional weapon and hadn't reported them. Or maybe it was the way she'd been able to adapt down to the surface to their troubles. 
There was no doubt she was a healer and committed to her job. But if she were human, Cass would say she had a dark side. He'd left sickbay without as much confidence as he'd hoped, but it would have to be enough. If he tried too hard, she'd see right through it, so all he could do was trust that he'd done as much as he could. Evie had reported back she hadn't made much progress with Zen for, as expected, and that she was turning in for the night, which allowed Cass some relief. He firmly believed the longer she went without relapsing, the stronger the box would get until there would no longer be any risk at all, which meant they could focus on their main objective, which would occupy the rest of Cass's evening while the rest of the crew reacclimated to their new ship and schedules. Got a minute? Cass asked, approaching Wolf Station on the bridge. It was almost time for third shift. It's all quiet. She indicated the empty view screen with a wave of her hand. I was going over the new specs for the engine. I think there might be a way to run it without Sester. She arched an eyebrow. Look. Cass handed her the tablet he'd been working on, going over all the new components. It was an ingenious design. Sleek and elegant, though he expected little less from Zen 4. Four conduits, four engineers. Four? she asked. You, me, Tyler, and Vreej, Cass said. If we each regulate one of the conduits at the same time and can work in tandem through the cycles, we can get the undercurrent up and running. Once we're in the undercurrent, Tyler should be able to stabilize the process to be self-sustaining. He wouldn't need us again until it was time to come out. That's a delicate procedure and would require precise timing. Her face betrayed no hint of emotion. Exactly. We'll need to run through a few practice trials. But with this new configuration, I believe it's possible. He'd hoped for more of a reaction. It was a way back, after all. Huh. She scanned the tablet containing the information he'd pulled together. I'm surprised you never tried anything like this while you were waiting, as a way to test the engines, Cass said. Yeah, well, we weren't exactly fully staffed. I wasn't comfortable moving the ship without enough of a crew to keep her going. Plus, if we had, we might not have been able to return. She handed the tablet back to him. Ryan tells me there was a time when he was in stasis for over ten years, Cass said. He didn't like Wolf's lack of enthusiasm at the possibility of leaving the system. Didn't she want to get away from this place? Wolf shrugged. We kept a lot of people under for long periods of time. It can get pretty boring up here with nothing to look at except the same green planet every day. I kept thinking maybe the Bulak would come back. But we never saw anyone in all that time. She stood and leaned close to him. My bet is because they think this place is cursed. Highly religious people and all that. Cass nodded. He couldn't help but think of Zal, who was resting peacefully in his room now. What had he thought of this place? Had it seemed cursed to him as well? No one would have faulted you for leaving, you know. Eighteen years is a long time to wait. For anyone, I don't care if they're in stasis units or not. The lights on the bridge dimmed automatically, indicating the start of third shift. The hypervator doors opened to reveal the change in crew as Wolf locked down her station. I know back then you didn't know me very well, and I hadn't been part of this crew for very long, she said, moving out of the way. But I wasn't about to leave anyone to die out here alone. We never stopped looking for a way to come down and get you. It's just, she turned away, some things aren't possible. Apparently done with the conversation, Wolf made her way to the hypervader and stepped inside with the rest of the second shift. Her eyes didn't meet his until the last second before the hypervader doors closed, and Cass found himself questioning what had just happened. Something about all of this gnawed at him, and he wasn't going to give up trying to find out what it was. But for the moment, he had to prepare his report for Evie on their engine situation. He believed it could work, no matter if Wolf was excited about it or not. But he wasn't above getting a little reassurance. I heard they'd stuck you down here. The alien glanced over his shoulder at Cass, 
a grin forming across his considerable lips, revealing the sharp tips of his white teeth. Cass noticed, despite the amount of time that had passed, Breege was still missing one of the mandibles on his back. The other lay flat against his right shoulder blade, exposed through a seam built into the overshirt he wore. Though he didn't wear boots as he had the last time Cass saw him. Instead, his bare feet at the end of long heels stood on the deck plating of the main computer control room. Caspian, he said, extending his four-fingered hand to Cass in a friendly gesture. Cass cocked his head, surprised. But he took the hand anyway and gave it a firm shake. Picked a few things up, I see. Breach gestured around him. Mostly humans. Eventually, I figured out your second language. And no more stuttering, Cass said, impressed. How long were you out of stasis? Four years total. Not long. I found it lonely outside. And... His eyes darkened. What is it? He shook his head instead of touching his head with his fingers, as his people normally did to indicate a no. The disparity was a little jarring, since from Cass's perspective, he'd only seen Reach a few days ago. Somehow this was harder to accept than the age he saw on everyone else's faces. Many thought we'd never see the rest of you again. It's strange to have you back. Trust me. That feeling goes both ways, Cass said, looking around. Like everywhere else in the ship, the main computer control room had been redesigned to be more efficient, though the core itself seemed relatively untouched. Wolf put you in charge of core maintenance? He nodded. Again, the movement was so strange coming from him. Cass had gotten used to his unique form of body language. She thought my analytical mind would work well down here, Plus, it reminds me of home. Everything is so compact. You never had the desire to return? Cass wasn't sure he would have stayed with an alien ship if his own people were not more than a few light years away, even if they were destitute and struggling to survive. Breeds cast his eyes downward. After what happened to Diamond, I decided it was best not to return. In truth, he was the reason I hadn't been raided myself. Despite his faults, he did watch out for me on occasion. His successor would not be so generous. I'm sorry to hear that, Cass said. I know what it's like not being able to return home. Breach flashed him a toothy grin again. No matter. This has been good for me. Just the right amount of challenge to keep Breach sharp. Good because that's part of the reason I'm here. Cass produced the small tablet he'd showed to Wolf. I'm going to get your thoughts on this. A way to run the undercurrent engine without Sester. Breach hesitated just a moment too long, enough to catch Cass's attention before taking the tablet and looking it over. He tapped a few buttons on the side, and the text on the screen transformed into his native language. Ah, I see... I, uh, b b believe this would be possible, he grimaced. Cass decided not to mention his slip. It was obvious Reed had worked hard to free himself from that tick, and he didn't need others pointing out his mistakes. He probably heard it louder than Cass had in his own head. Breach handed the tablet back to him. You agree we need to perform some tests first? Breach nodded. And you'd be willing to help out? Work with the rest of us to utilize the system? Another wordless nod. He was probably afraid the next word out of his mouth would be another stutter. Great. I'll speak to the captain, and hopefully we can begin trials tomorrow. S sounds good, he said, wincing as the words escaped his mouth. Cass bet if his face could redden, it would have. He decided to leave the man in peace rather than bother him any further. It's good to see you again. And for what it's worth, I'm glad you stayed. He placed a reassuring hand on Breed's shoulder. I'll see you tomorrow. Breed gave him a curt nod and a smile, then returned to his work monitoring the computer core. Cass would have taken that as an insult in any other situation. But this was Breed, not Joral Page. 
he left him alone with some hope this plan might work. What followed after that, he couldn't say. 8. As Cass made his way down the corridor, he still had a hard time wrapping his mind around being back aboard this ship, and the fact it was in near pristine condition. Not only did it seem brand new, but it was clean. Much cleaner than he would have expected, considering there had only been so many to stay behind. Sanfor and Wolf must have kept them on a strict schedule to maintain this level of spotlessness. He and Box had had enough trouble keeping the reasonable excuse clean, and it had been tiny in comparison. Then again, in those days, they hadn't been motivated to keep things up. His courier missions involved transporting dignitaries, escorts of dignitaries, and escorts with dignitaries, all of which required a certain amount of discretion. Which meant they didn't come into the main part of the ship, and Cass didn't go back there. In fact, the only things he did keep clean had been the hub suites, giving them a thorough decontamination after every trip. He couldn't say he missed that life, though sometimes it had had its moments. Before he had a chance to slip further into the nostalgia that threatened to overwhelm him, two strong hands grabbed his lapels and pulled him around into the adjacent corridor, slamming him back up against the wall. He grunted as his head smacked against the hard metal plating, knocking him for a loop. His hand went for his boom cannon, only to find nothing there as he'd returned it to the weapons lockup when he'd come back on board. He glanced up, expecting to see someone much larger than him, only to find himself staring into a pair of hard blue eyes, partially covered by mats of dirty blonde hair. He was lost in those eyes for just a moment, having never seen them this close, or expecting their owner to be the one to attack him. But he had enough time at the moment to realize he'd look back on this moment and figure it was inevitable. Assault of a senior officer. That's a court-martial, Cass said, doing his best to keep his voice calm. Don't make me laugh, Chief Raffenkel replied, her eyes burning with rage. He couldn't believe how strong she was. He wriggled to free himself from her grip. But she'd pinned him using what had to be her leverage, since she was no taller than he was. Assault of a criminal isn't even a tribunal. Cass glanced down to her hands holding him in place. Her knuckles were white and strained, and the veins in her hands stood out against the skin like power conduits. He cast his gaze back to her. I assume there's a point to this. I know, she said, a small grin appearing at the edges of her mouth. At first, he thought she might have lost more than a couple weeks in the jungles down on the planet. But then his mind solidified around Evie's incident. She couldn't mean that, could she? Box had said there was no one else around, though it wasn't as if he had time to do a thorough scan. He'd been busy trying to keep Evie from killing him and anyone else. And one of his optical sensors had been out. As soon as the thought crossed his mind, Raffenkel's smile grew, and he knew she could see the realization on his face. He cursed not playing more card games when he'd been part of the Sargon Commonwealth and developing his poker face into an uncrackable enigma. That's right, she whispered, not taking her eyes off Cass, and I have a long memory. And you let her loose in the ship again, after what she did. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, not even believing his own words. They came out too forced, too desperate. You do, she replied, not losing her grin. And you're going to hang for it. If you thought betraying your commanding officer was bad, wait until the coalition hears you let a murderer continue to act as a captain of the ship. That's your big concern, he countered, finding his footing. There may not even be a coalition left. And you're more interested in making sure I pay for something that may or may not have happened? He wasn't about to admit to it in the event she was recording their conversation or had an accomplice nearby. In fact, he hoped she did. It would be proof of this attack. Her grin disappeared. You just better hope she doesn't fall back into her old habits. You might not be willing to do what's necessary, but I am. Cass furrowed his brow. 
And what does that mean? What exactly are you going to do? She let go of his shirt and took two steps back, so her face fell into the shadows cast by the lighting of the adjacent corridor. All that matters is I don't easily forget the things I see. I want you to keep that in mind, and pray that I'm wrong, because if I'm not, it's blood on your hands, too. With that, she turned and strode down the empty corridor, leaving Cass standing up against the wall. His first thought was to come up with some reason to arrest her, to keep her in the brig so she wouldn't go around spreading what she'd seen to everyone else. But no, if he did that, it would only draw Evie's attention to the situation. And by confronting him here, Raffenkel had probably already put safeguards in place to make sure the information found its way to the light in the event something happened to her. Raffenkel might be brash, but she wasn't stupid and Cass couldn't afford to underestimate her. If she had seen what Evie had done down to the planet, then he had a much bigger problem than he wanted to admit. "'And you're sure there was no one else there?' Cass asked, as Box paced his quarters, his head down, and one hand rubbing what passed for his chin. "'I told you I can't give you any guarantees. I was trying not to be chopped in half. You saw what she'd already done to my neck servos.' For a second there, I thought she was going to take my head off, Box protested, not slowing the pacing. So Raffenkel could have seen everything, and you never would have known it. Cass sat on the edge of his bed, his arms folded on his knees as he stared at the floor. After I drugged the captain, there was no one else there until Dr. Zax came running up to check on Lieutenant Yamashita. And Marshall. He was still alive then, of course. Cass cast his gaze over to the small desk in his room, where a small black orb sat, glassy and still. Marshall had placed it in Cass's hand as he lay dying at the back of the shuttle. But Cass had no idea what it was, or what it was supposed to do. He'd run a smattering of tests on it, finding nothing. As far as he was concerned, it was nothing more than a doorstop, and not a very big one at that. And she hasn't approached you about it? Box stopped pacing and shook his head. I haven't even seen the chief since we got back. Cass scoffed. She probably blames this whole thing on me. More than likely, she doesn't even know you're involved. After all, you were the one to stop Evie. What are you going to do? Cass threw his hands up. What can I do? I can't exactly accuse her of lying, because that would risk Evie hearing the details of what had happened and you said that could trigger a relapse. Box put the index and thumb of each hand together in an OK symbol and leaned down. Potentially, not guaranteed, again, he dropped his hands. What was that? What did you just do? Cass asked. The emphasis thing. You know, when someone keeps asking you asinine questions and you have to reiterate to them. They're not getting anywhere, so you mock them by exaggerating the fact they're saying the same things repeatedly? He paused. Oh, wait. I think I got that wrong. He formed the first two fingers on both hands into little hooks and wiggled them up and down. Potentially. There we go. Cass shook his head. I don't know what we're supposed to do here. Who knows how many other people she's told. Does that matter? Box asked. It's your word against hers. Or technically, it's mine, since I was the only one there. His eyes blinked rapidly. Oh, Cor, it's mine. He began pitching back and forth like he was having a fit, and Cass jumped up off the bed. What is it? What's wrong? I'm hyperventilating. Can't you see that? Box yelled. Cass rolled his eyes and returned to his bed. You don't even have lungs, drama queen. Yeah? It's not your metal ass on the line here. You know how bad I am at lying. What if someone comes up and questions me? What if they want to put me on the stand? I can't hold up under that kind of pressure. I'll crack before someone asks me my name. I'll spill every secret I've ever been told. Like that time when you stayed in that nice hotel out on Trask and you got super drunk the night before and threw up into the commode. 
When you tried to flush, it only backed up out of the floor. And you had to use the sheets to wipe it up, because they were the only thing that could handle that much puke. Then you just tossed it in the corner and left. Remember that? Yes, he said through gritted teeth. Or that time that Alsatian invited you up to her room, only it turned out to be what she called a milking station, and she had you strapped into the, Okay, I get it. You're terrible at keeping secrets. Look, she's not going to come for you. Her beef is with me over what happened with Griffin. You'd think after this much time she would have let that go. But old grudges die hard, I guess. Cass sighed and flopped back out of the bed. We'll just have to find a way to keep an eye on her. I guess she won't do anything until we get back to the coalition space, assuming we even can. But she's not thinking clearly. She's assuming there will be someone to report this to. And when we get there, I'm concerned about what she might do if we find the coalition in pieces. He sat up. Eighteen years is a long time. Box blinked his yellow eyes in worry. He was right to be concerned. And Cass couldn't say Raffenkel wouldn't approach him. They might have to run through some scenarios so he would be prepared. Box worked much better when he had a script to stick to. But the bad thing about scripts was they weren't adaptable, and Box was notoriously bad at improvising. You think she might try, what, to harm the captain? Cass shook his head. I don't know. And it isn't like I can bring this to Weavy, can I? She'd ask why, of course. Then I'd be stuck needing to make up something that didn't happen, so she didn't become suspicious of what did. He ran his hands down his face. If only I'd been there. She would have run you through, too, Box said. No question. Cass stared up at his friend. We're just going to have to be extra vigilant. Especially if we manage to leave orbit. See if you can figure out a way to track her movements without alerting the internal security units. I don't want the ship to do it, because there will be a record of it. And if Evie sees it... Yeah, yeah, relapse. I know. I'm the one who told you. I'll see if I can come up with something. Box made his way to the door. You better hope I don't get accosted in the hallway. We need a code word. Let's make it... Nudyasturtian. Please tell me that doesn't mean what I think it means, Cass said. Box's eyes blinked once. It means the day before yesterday. What did you think it meant? Cass waved him off. You are exhausting. Get your mind out of the gutter, you sicko. This is serious. He took one last look at Cass before leaving him alone in his room. After the door shut, Cass's pillow smacked the closed panels and slid to the floor. Nine. Evie didn't sleep well. Her dreams were punctuated by images of running, dark tunnels, and endless cliffs. And each time, they'd wake her up and she'd check the time, only to find it had been twenty minutes since the last time she shot out of bed. She considered going down to sick bay for a sleep aid, but instead thought back to those tiny pills she'd been using before, and stayed still instead. She wasn't going to lean on anything else, not unless it was necessary. Plus, she was still recovering from a head injury. Things like sleep were bound to be different for a time. Though she didn't remember having this much trouble after her last injury at the hands of Diamond. But then again, that hadn't been head trauma. She'd slept better after that one, her body taking the time it needed to heal. Evie wished her head would hurry up already. After the tenth nightmare, she finally got out of bed and ready for the day. She was tired of fighting sleep, so she might as well get something done. She had the computer make a quick breakfast before heading to the bridge and taking over for third shift. When the hypervator doors opened, it took her a moment to remember why it looked so different. She'd gotten so used to the old bridge, the sight of this one temporarily sent a shiver of terror through her, though she couldn't understand why. The bridge was nothing to be afraid of. This ship was her home. Evie took a deep breath 
and spoke with Lieutenant Latimer on watch to make sure nothing had changed overnight, to which he confirmed it hadn't. No ships had been launched from the surface, and no threats had appeared in orbit. Probably because if the time distortion was constant, the aliens down at the surface, if any remained, were moving so slowly in comparison to their ship, it would be years before they managed to leave the planet's surface and come after them. That was, unless they managed to get the time distortion under control. But there had been no indication of any changes on the surface since she'd woken up in sickbay. Evie decided to spend the rest of her morning in her command room, catching up on anything else she might have missed, and hopefully coming up with a way to return to Coalition space. Without Sester, the ship couldn't even get out of this system, much less travel the 700 light-years back to the edge of Coalition-held territory. She wished she could speak with him. During the night, in the middle of two terrifying nightmares, she'd tried reaching out with her mind to see if she could find a thread of him somewhere, but there was nothing. It was like he didn't exist anymore, and she couldn't understand why. Wolf speculated it was because Claxians needed other Claxians to survive, and Sester had gone so long without any, he'd finally lost the will to continue. But he'd had Zenfor here, and while she wasn't a Claxian, Evie knew she was the next best thing. She'd witnessed them together. But even now, it felt as if Zenfor had closed the door on any further possibilities with him, which didn't make sense. Unless it was a sill thing, and she was ignorant to it. She awoke to the sound of her door chiming and bolted straight up. Apparently, she'd fallen asleep at her desk. Checking the time, she saw she'd been out for almost three hours. She shook her head and tried to clean the hard residue from the corners of her eyes. Maybe she could only sleep sitting up. If that was the case, she might just try tonight here in the command room. The door chimed again. Enter, she said, smoothing the front of her uniform. Cass took two steps inside before catching a look at her and stopped. I can come back, he said. He held a small tablet. But she noticed his eyes were bloodshot as well. Maybe she wasn't the only one not sleeping on this ship. Evie shook her head. Let me see it. She held out her hand. What? he asked, looking down. Whatever bad news you've brought me. I knew this ship was too good to be true. He grinned and took a seat, handing her the tablet. Believe it or not, this is a good thing, I think. It's a plan to use the undercurrent without Sester. It took her eyes a second to focus on the detailed plans in front of her. Is that possible? Let's just say it has potential. And right now is our best chance of getting back home. Evie studied the plans, blinking a few times to remove the lingering fog in her mind. Four engineers, four conduits. It was deceptively simple. But the more she read, the more she realized it would require some precision of the parts of everyone involved. Have you spoken to the others about this? He nodded. No one's told me it can't work. But I figured it was intuitive. Why they haven't tried it before now is beyond me. She handed the tablet back to him. Maybe they were just waiting on your winning personality. He began to smile, but then it fell away, as if he'd remembered something unpleasant. What is it? He reset. Nothing. If you're ready to approve this, I'll get down to engineering so we can begin running tests. I want to make sure we get this exactly right before we go for the real thing. Evie regarded him for a moment. Either he was acting odd, or she was still out of it. She had no way to be sure. Yeah, I think it's worth a shot. Have you thought about what we might find when we get there? His gaze was hard, as if he expected the worst. To be honest, I've been trying not to think about it. Just been focusing on the ship, getting the crew back together, you know. She shrugged. I'm not sure what we'll do. We'll have to see what's there before we can make any decisions. Who knows? Maybe they managed to repel the attacks. Or the seal helped. It's hard to say. She didn't want to admit it. But ever since she'd found out they'd missed the last 18 years, she'd feared there was nothing left of the coalition. 
They'd arrive back to find the entire region decimated, trillions of people killed, thousands of planets destroyed. In the amount of time they'd been gone, Andromeda could have swept through the galaxy like a plague. It was the reason she hadn't been as anxious to return as she had before they'd landed on the planet. Cass pursed his lips, unable to come up with a response. Did he feel the same way? Or did he know something she didn't? Something about his behavior was off, but she was too afraid to ask. She knew she should, and she wanted to, but couldn't find the words. I'll go ahead and get started. It will take a few minutes to set up the tests. Do you want to watch, or... I'll just wait until you think you're ready. Then we can run through it one last time before the real thing. Why did she feel so awkward? This wasn't like her, was it? See you in a few, then. He turned and left her alone to the command room. She happened to glance down at the black obsidian desk and caught a reflection of the polished surface. For a moment, she thought she saw something foreign there. But when she looked again, it was nothing more than her own face staring back at her. As Cass made his way down to engineering, he couldn't help but wonder if he should have told Evie about his suspicions regarding the ship. He wasn't even sure if you could call them suspicions, more like a general feeling of unease. In addition to Sester's situation, no one who had been on the ship over the past 18 years seemed to be in any rush to return home. But when Evie had expressed similar concerns, he thought maybe he was being too suspicious. The passage of that much time had to have an effect on people, good or bad. Maybe they'd resigned themselves to the fact they'd spend the rest of their lives on Tempest. Maybe they hadn't expected the rest of the crew to return, he couldn't say. But it still gnawed at him. Especially how Wolf kept Ryan sealed up for over a decade. Who else had been locked down that long? And why? He might get Box to pull the medical records and see if anyone else had a similar lengthy stint. Then there was the matter of the four members of the crew lost to decompression. Not that it was so unusual. In fact, only losing four in a matter of nearly two decades was something of a minor miracle. But it was the fact that the sensors had been turned off that gave Cass pause. That would have needed to be overridden in order to be off and Wolf was probably the only person aboard who'd had the authority to do that. Something about it didn't add up. But he didn't need to trouble Evie with it. Not until he was sure she would be okay. So far, everything was going well. But she hadn't interacted with many of the crew yet, and it was possible the smallest thing might set her off. He'd have to continue to investigate on his own. And when he was sure she could be trusted to handle it, he bring his concerns to her. In the back of his mind, that box holding all his guilt rattled against its lock, threatening to break free. Cass mentally threw another chain around it and pushed it even further away. He had too much to deal with at the moment and couldn't let it distract him. And then there was his other problem. Cass tapped the back of his hand. Box, checking in. I wanted to see if you'd solve that problem we talked about last night. What problem? he asked, his voice cheerful. Cass gritted his teeth. Our problem with the monitor. Oh, not there yet, boss. Still exploring options. I'll let you know when I have something. But I can't talk right now. Working on an important experiment. The line cut off. Wait, I... Cass tapped the back of his hand again. Try not to let it get to him. Box, come in. There was no response. He hit it again, too hard, causing the back of his hand to throb. He only hoped he had better luck with the engines. 10. Everyone ready? Lieutenant Tyler called out over the low din of the conduits. A quarter of the way around the second level, Commander Wolf nodded. Ready, Reed said from the third level, another quarter of the way around. Do it, Cass replied from his position on the ground level. Zenfor stood near the back of the room at her control station, monitoring her upgrades and staring up at the conduit bundle. The plan was to engage the undercurrent drive, stabilize it, 
then Zenfor could activate the micro-jump she'd used to get them out this far in the first place. They were on hour four of what was supposed to be a two-hour trial run, and Cass was close to the end of his rope. Going in five, four, three, two... Tyler held up his right hand, then dropped it. Activating one, Wolf said. Two is go, Breach yelled from above. Cass watched as a pulsing current came across his monitor, the glowing hot energy from the conduits radiating all over him. He hit a quick sequence of buttons to keep the current active. Three is clear. Tyler focused down on his own station, working as the current made one full revolution. I'm good. Keep it going. I've got it, Wolf said. Clear. It's destabilizing, Reed yelled. Cass cursed. Reinforce it. Don't let it slip. His station lit up, but the current coming through was a quarter of the power it had been on the first revolution. He did what he could to keep it together, but it fizzled and died before he could pass it on to Tyler. Son of a bitch! Cass slammed his hand down at the control station, producing a clean crack in the display. The station went dark. I don't get this. It should work. He glanced up to Vreej looking down on him from two levels above and narrowed his eyes. I want to see what's going on up there. Something went wrong between one and two. He stepped over to the small lift that took him two levels up, where he came face to face with Vreej. It just degraded, Vreej said, blocking his way. Cass pushed around him, examining his station. Everything looked normal, but something wasn't right. Either a foreign object or an obtrusive force had to be disrupting the flow. There was no other explanation. And he'd already scanned the conduits, finding no foreign objects. I told you this might be a long shot, Wolf said from below. I don't accept that, Cass called back. If it wasn't Regis' station, it had to be Wolf's. He got back on the lift and took it down to the second level. Wolf tried to block her station as well. Commander, we may just have to accept... Cass maneuvered around her to inspect the station. Everything checked out as normal. He even ran the simulation back to see if he'd missed something, but it all checked out. The pulse was just losing power for some reason. Sester had managed to manipulate all four of these conduits at once. It was what gave him the unique ability to engage the drive and why no other coalition ships could travel this fast as Tempest. But there had to be a way to make this work. Cass wasn't going to give up. He turned to Wolf. Let's run it again. She threw up her hands in frustration, turning her back on him. We've gone through it 29 times already. It's not going to work. He turned to Vreej. Is the math solid? Vreej hesitated, then nodded. Then I refuse to accept the laws of physics have just decided to stop working on board this ship, Cass said. His voice raised more than he'd intended. Screw the simulation. I want to run it for real. Wolf spun on him. Are you crazy? We could blow the entire conduit system. What would... She must have seen something on Cass's face that told her she'd stepped over a line. Sorry, Commander. What I mean is, how can we run it in real time if all the simulations have failed? The door to engineering rolled away, and Edie walked in with an easy demeanor as if she were admiring the view. Cass caught her eye before she turned away. Here's the reality of the situation, Commander. We are not staying in orbit of this accursed planet one second longer than necessary. We're going back to the Coalition, or we're going to die trying. Is that clear? Wolf sucked her lips between her teeth and shifted her glance between him and Evie, as if contemplating the risk of trying to pit them against one another. Finally, she dropped her head. All right. Cass pointed at Tyler as he took the small lift back down to the main level. Disengage the simulation and activate the primary engine banks. We're doing this. He tapped his comm. Cass to Ensign Rond. Move us out of standard orbit and prepare to enter an undercurrent. Aye, Commander, Rond said. Tyler shook his head, then leaned over the control station typing out a series of commands as Evie walked over to Cass. Commander? She said it with a smile in her voice, even though there was none on her face. She knew how much he didn't think the rank fit him. 
It looks like you might be putting my ship in mortal danger. Cass wiped at the perspiration on his brow. He no longer had the luxury of keeping this from her. He leaned in close. Evie, something is wrong. I've noticed. I get a notification every time the simulation fails. He shook his head. No. I mean, I think someone is trying to stop us from leaving here. And I can't figure out why. Evie narrowed her eyes. You mean we have a saboteur aboard? I don't know if I'd go that far. But it feels like there are extra obstacles in our way. Someone is mucking up these tests. For what reason, I don't know. But I'm betting they're not willing to kill us all in the process. She glanced at the others working on their individual stations. Even to Zenfor behind them, whose gaze remained impassive. That's a big risk, but if you think it's what's happening, then let's go with your recommendation. He was taken aback. Usually, even when she agreed with him, she'd give him more pushback than that. Wasn't she worried it was too risky? Are you sure? You're the engineer, right? Cass tried to think back. When, in the entire time he'd known Evie, had she ever just deferred to his judgment? When had she never taken the reins and plotted her own course? He couldn't think of a time off the top of his head, and that bothered him. We're set up here, Commander, Tyler said. He ran his fingers under his eyes, as if to underscore his fatigue. Cass had seen Tyler stay in engineering late into the night, and was already there when Cass had arrived in the morning. Did the man sleep at all? Are you two ready? Cass stared up at Wolf and Vrij on the respective levels, Vrij nodded and returned to his station. Wolf held Cass's gaze a moment, then retreated to her station as well. Cass addressed Zenfor. How does it look over there? Optimal. Once the current is stable, I'll activate the system. She crossed her considerable arms, looking like someone about to enter a wumpum match. For a moment, Cass had the entertaining image in his head of her taking on a foe in the hand-to-hand -hand combat. He knew who he'd be placing his bet on if that fight ever did happen. Cass turned to Evie one more time. Last chance to back out. She shook her head. I trust you know what you're doing. She crossed her own arms, but more to hold herself than look intimidating. It made her seem smaller in some way, and Cass didn't like the way it made him feel. That box in the back of his mind rattled. He took up a station, pushing it away again to concentrate on the task at hand. Whenever you're ready, Lieutenant, he said. Tyler tapped his comm. Bridge, this is engineering. Ready? Ready, sir, Ensign River said. Tyler nodded at Cass, then raised his hand. It trembled when he first raised it. Going in five. Cass steadied himself, shooting looks back to Evie and Zenfor. They watched with interest. Four? He peered up at Wolf, hunched over her station, grabbing the sides until her normally copper knuckles were white. Three? Above all of them, Reed stood at the furthest station. But he wasn't watching the monitor in front of them. Instead, his focus was on the Katowitz themselves. Cass was about to tell him to focus when Reed diverted his attention back to his station. Two? Totter's arm visibly shook, then dropped. Activate. The conduit in the middle of the room pulsed with a white light. It began in the middle and pulsed out. Activating one, Wolf yelled. Structure is stable. Two is good, Breach called from above them. Cass's station lit up with the information, and he could clearly see the undercurrent generators were stable, more than they had been in the tests. He initialized three and passed it along, monitoring the output. Three's good. He glanced over to Tyler, who remained hunched over his screen. Evie stood behind him, watching him work, still hugging herself, but the sweat running down Tyler's brow was visible, even from Cass's position. Four is good. Still stable. The integrity is holding, Wolf said from above. I'm locking down number one. Locking down two. Good to go, Reed added. Cass checked his screen, noting that the field and emitters were holding. Something that hadn't happened in 20-plus tests. He knew it. Whoever didn't want them leaving 
wasn't willing to destroy the ship over it. Three's locked down. That's four, Tyler said, maintaining current output. He turned to Weavy. The undercurrent is stable, Captain. She glanced to Cass, her mouth turning in a little smile. Bridge, this is the Captain. Proceed into the undercurrent. Aye, Rond replied. Cass double-checked his system, making sure all the variables were accounted for before leaving his station. He walked over and clapped Tyler on the back. Congratulations, he said. We're not in the clear yet. If there's a variant, we'll have to realign the system, I know, Cass said. But in comparison to opening the undercurrent, an alignment was easy. And two people could do it in a pinch if necessary, instead of four. He and Evie made their way over to Zen 4. How does it look? Acceptable, she said. I can engage the upgrades using this current. Anything unexpected? Cass asked, allowing his pride to show through. He'd known it would work. There had never been a doubt in his mind. No, we're ready to proceed. Evie's gaze had seemed to have glassed over for a moment. Are we good? He nudged her. She blinked a few times. Hmm? Oh, yes. Whenever you're ready. The box rattled again. Zenfor initialized her unique system. Coming online now. The first micro jump will be in a few moments. All variables are stable, and the ship is holding a perfect velocity. She tapped a button, and the ship seemed to lurch under them. First jump confirmed. We are on our way. Cass stepped back, trying to suppress a grin. They were finally going back. After all the damage they'd taken, after all the people they'd lost, they were returning home. The question remained, what would be left when they arrived? <laughs>